Hello and welcome to episode 348 of the Awesome Comics Podcast, a place where the small press makes one hell of a big noise. I'm Vince Hunt and joining me as always is the creator of the webcomic Vanguard, Dan Butcher. Hello. Comic writer, reviewer and someone who's destined to be a Doctor Who assistant one day in the future or oh, maybe no the past. Assistant, my friend. What? He's... Even to the Doctor? Come on. Surely the, the Doctor's going to go. Be oh, look. He'd be the Doctor. I've oh, been look. approached a number of times to take over the role. What? You're what, talking about t- Doctor Screw in the TARDIS. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that was starring Tony Esmond. <laughs> Let's get that rumour going. It's not yeah. even Bush in that. I've watched it three oh times. My I can't see anything. God. <laughs> you opened that door. Oh, <laughs> I did. I did. No, I didn't. I, did. I didn't. I am. Disgusting, a, Vince. I'm co- I am <laughs> completely innocent in all of this, and I have okay. a witness. Because this week we're joined another by innocent person. N- another innocent person who's uh, never heard such filth in all his life. Yes, the writer and mind behind titles like Flintlock, The Clockwork Cavalier, and, and the brainchild behind Time Bomb Comics. You may also recognise him at conventions. If you've ever walked past a fabulously dressed gentleman at a show and thought, who is that stylishly <laughs> dressed man? You're probably talking about Steve Tanner. Welcome to the show, Steve. Thanks very much for inviting me on. Um, <laughs> hey, Steve. Pleasure. Now, you don't wear that jacket in a certain rough pub in in uh, Harrogate, do you? Because we noticed. It's what stopped us recognising you immediately. That's right. It comes out at certain occasions and when it feels appropriate. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and you don't want to get in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it, it didn't feel appropriate there. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good good call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, it's it's great. Whenever I um, see see you at a convention, Steve, you were, how many different jackets have you got? Oh, uh, I think I've, I've got about fifteen or sixteen. Oh, wow, um, wow. something like that. But but some of them, you know, and I really, you know, I can't wear it at a convention because they they're just too loud. So I wear <laughs> the ones that, which are a little bit quieter for the convention. Just for like. putting the bins out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> 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 oh, now this, I did actually meet you at a comic convention when you weren't tabling and you were actually a little bit toned down I remember when we met at that convention that shall not be named in Birmingham once oh, said, right, what's yeah. happened Steve you know, we've got your jacket on you went well no I'm not at a table am I <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's it's, a, it's great. It's, it's become as, as synonymous with um, with the jackets become synonymous with time bomb as uh, as, as the comic yeah. now. So it's it's kind of a nice little link, really. Do you think there that's a really... cool thing to do? Do you think that, like? It, it, I mean, obviously, it, immediately I recognise time time bomb and Steve Tanner. You know, because because of that. Do you think that's um, it's a good thing for creators to do sometimes to have that sort of element that people recognise every time they they come to a table above the books, beyond the books. Well, I think I think it, it helps because then people kind of, um, you know, people. I, I know I, sometimes I've heard other people describe me, and they say, "You know, the guy with the jacket," and the person usually says, "Oh, yeah, I know." <laughs> and and in, in in the um, about about I don't know five, six seven years ago, um, I I stopped wearing them for a couple of conventions, and I started having people complaining that, um, oh. Oh, and I wow. didn't realise that that. Well, that tell them you know, fuck off. i found out that my my role at a a convention was more than just someone behind behind the table and the creator is actually kind of like um you know like a place to meet because you know like you have the the block in the center of the square um i found out that people would say oh just meet me just just opposite that guy with a with a really leery jacket um and that was my um that's so that's what people were using me for as well so um you know there were about half a dozen conventions i uh, and i just turned up in um without the jackets and then um i was getting emails and people coming up and complaining and um, so um i started wearing them again so um, <laughs> Bloody hell. You, you it, calm it's, down, a, it's a monster of your own making <laughs> yeah it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're we're not going to use you on this show, Steve. We're not. We are a little bit. We're not going to. Uh, well, yeah, we will. But, but actually, the shame is, it's, it's an audio medium. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Although I've just seen you, and you aren't wearing that jacket. Oh much, look, no, no. <laughs> That's, no, no. Well, right. yeah, we always, we always get everyone to um, dress like we do, completely naked. Uh, whenever we record the show. I can tell the story early of um, one of my last contacts with Steve was um, a certain Coventry convention where I'd been winding him up all weekend and accusing him of being a dogger. And then as he <laughs> left the room, um, he shouted across me and a number of customers. It's okay, I knew them. Uh, shout, Tony, I've got that dogging map for you. <laughs> and he proper done me. <laughs> 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 see, 
See, you've just gone up several notches on the respect yeah. ladder, Steve. <laughs> Immediately there. Funny. I mean, going back to what you said, it is interesting because people have come across to the table and started looking at, at, at the books simply because they've noticed what I'm wearing. So they'll come up because and they'll say, oh, oh, that's, that's, I can't believe what you're wearing or where do you get that? I bet there's not many like that in the world. And to be honest, they're right because they're, they're all made to order. Um, so, um, oh they, my it, god, but it, it's led you like to Liberace, Steve. Steve. You like Liberace, it's, <laughs> it's led to sales because of that. So, I can't knock them at all. Um, it's led yeah. to sales. So, it, it, it's a great kind of opening gamut because a lot of the time it shows, you know, you, you, you're not sure what to say to people sometimes, yeah, or how to catch their attention. And if you don't need to catch their attention, say anything to them, and that they, they kind of spot you. They will, they will kind of come across, and then you can kind of have a conversation. So, they're, 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 you know, the jackets are great in that respect. Yeah, it's sometimes starting that engagement, isn't it? I mean, because we've had it at our table, haven't we, haven't we, guys, where some of our best, we've had some fantastic chats with people, but sometimes it, it's the longest chats, the ones where the per, the sort of the punter starts the starts the conversation, and that's it. Then five ten minutes go by, yeah. and you're just chatting. At time. least, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I've still got but, pictures of you after an hour and a half of talking to someone about Punisher once. Well, <laughs> that, that was that was a time. That was a bad day. That was that was that, 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 that was, that was where that knob with the gloves on picked up every single book and read it on our table. Uh, that's, that's, that should be done, should it? Yeah, at least he's wearing gloves. Yeah. Um, Do you know where you can pick up loads of other comics and read them? There. Oh, good chat. Where Dan? Comichouse.com. Don't make him do the whole spiel. Don't do it, Vince. I know how you bully him. I, I'm, I can't do the spiel. No, oh, I don't know it. You've got it written down, Vince. No, I don't know what you mean. I mean, <laughs> here we go. If you were to say the spiel, what would it sound like? <laughs> well, it probably it probably say that Comic House and Indie Comic Marketplace with a difference. They're our sponsor, and there's a huge selection of titles on their database. Like, in the, if you self publish, you can list your book on there, and it's another avenue to start selling your books. And plus, they also have an app, which is amazing. Yes. Um, and yeah. there's there's a fe- featured section on on the app and on the site, and it's basically this it's like netflix for comics it's a subscription only three pounds a month yeah you get access to an enormous library of digital indie comics which being added to all the time and then i'd probably ask dan what well, what's on there at the moment dan uh we've got several new titles and i'm going to read out the synopsis synopsis of synopses, synopses of, synopsis of, of two of them. we've got a uh, future sci-fi tales spatial void volume one six creative teams six mind-blowing sci-fi tales read about galactic mercenaries Forbidden Love, Mechs, Mighty Planet Protectors, Aliens, and more. Forbidden Love. Forbidden Love in space. And we've got yeah. Fred Peterson, The Mighty Warlord, Volume 1, Talk Back at the Ocean. Uh, is that the name of the title, or is that the creator's the, name? It's called. That's the name of the, the comic. It's called Fred Peterson, The Mighty Warlord. Okay. Uh, the Mighty Fred. Warlord is a world mixing together uh, Puerto Rican culture, fancy character development, action, and romantic comedy. Fred Peterson discovers he's destined to be a superhero, even if he doesn't want to. In this prologue, we introduce our main characters, Fred Peterson, Jane Jackson, Cheryl Smith, and John Gardner, and what is a normal night for them, anyway. There we go. That's for a teen audience. That was wonderfully done, Dan. Yes. So go enjoy that and many other titles. On Don't the enjoy podcast. Forbidden Love. <laughs> yes. That's well, the best I, mean, I mean, if they listen to this, the what? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, well, if it's in space... And you can read, yeah, you can read all of that on Comic House. Um, and if you're a creator, um, if you upload your uh, books on there at the moment, because right now there's probably a lot of people wondering where to get their digital comics. So sign up to this, and you've got a whole library to check out at the moment. Um, but if you're if you're a creator, you can add your profile pictures, social media links, and stuff. So if someone reads your comic and likes it, just out of the blue, because we've all read comics on there that we know nothing about the creators, and we end up um, following them. Probably making friends yeah. with them. The JWC is a, is a perfect example of that. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, I've, to, uh, use, to use an example of something Vince just said is, I'm not actually overly worried about the creators anymore. I just want to read a good comic. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but if you find See, a creator you like, then there's a link <laughs> yeah. to their their yeah. store and everything. Don't don't get to know them too well though; they'll only break your heart. <laughs> That's true. Steve, do you uh, read digital? Um, you affect- sometimes I I I I I to be perfectly honest, I'm very old school. In yeah. I, I can't beat the kind of turning the pages and so yeah um, i've tried reading digital comics and something which sometimes they're only available digitally anyway mm. and they've been fine mm. but overall i'll be honest i find it a bit of a hollow kind of experience um so uh, even with, with like kickstarters 
I, I know I can buy digital for, for loads of, of, of stuff, but I tend to get the get the print one, even if it's a bit more expensive and with post. Yeah. So yeah. I just, like, yeah, I just yeah. like the physicality of it. Um, but I think I think the stuff that, you know, it's, it's great that there is things like Comic House and, and, and Comixology and all that kind of stuff, because it, it, it's another means to get um, get work out there and get people reading comics. And I think some mm. people exclusively read digital, which, which, which yeah. is great. Um, yeah, I read it better on my if I'm reading it on my iPad, I concentrate better on it. But if I have it on a computer screen where I'm normally used to like scanning emails or whatever, you know, I don't read it as well. I think I think it's a whole mindset thing, isn't it? We just need to yeah. adjust ourselves. A yeah, bit sometimes. yeah. I, th- I think I think the digital medium can be really handy for um, creators that that can't that that haven't pushed into print or they're just starting out or you know they, they can't afford yeah. to get a print run of their comics and stuff but well, you just don't want to you just want to make something yeah. put it out there and walk away yeah. you know Every, sometimes yeah. it's just the classic stuff. webcomic isn't it just yeah, yeah. Uh, i've not been on to uh amazon stroke comiXology since this whole debacle i'm just like i'm gonna leave it till it sorts itself out i've just not yeah i've been on yeah. a couple of times it's just yeah. the, the searching facility is the bit that does mind it mine yeah it's yeah just, yeah we'll probably come back to that um yeah, should we thing. leave that maybe a month and come back to it? Yeah, see how it yeah. Sounds? Cause we yeah. had a look at it yeah. last week, didn't we? A bit, I suppose. Yeah. Well, we've got another month coming up, but um, until then, if you want to find out more about and to start a fourteen-day free trial to our lovely sponsors, go to comichouse dot com. And as I said, yeah. uh, next week we're starting manga month. Yes. Yay. Um, which is going to be a, a a month where we're exclusively talking about uh, manga comics, different genres, uh, the medium itself. Finding it, you know, there's also going to be information rather than "go, this is fucking awesome." Of course, yeah. there'll be there'll be a fair amount of that, um, which you've probably heard in recent months, actually, on this. I've very written show a load anyway. of phrases down. I've yeah. written a load of sort of different. So they call things differently, don't they? Uh, yeah. Go on, just drop drop yeah. a phrase on us now, just out of the blue, and see if, um, see if we can guess what it is. Oh, um, let me look. Oh, um, uh, pan pan. What? I don't know that one. Is that a, a genre? Derog- derogative term for women. Okay. Oh. Yokai. Oh, I know that one. That's the, the little Japanese spirit things. It's, it's strange apparitions, a class of supernatural entities okay. from Japanese folklore. Oh, yeah. yeah. I feel we're all going to be learning quite a bit over the next month or so. Was, yeah. uh, we'll be years. discovering stuff that a lot of our lovely listeners will go, oh, you oh, no slow- about that. Yeah, no yeah, about yeah. that. You're slow on the uptake. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, you never know. You never know. But what we do know is this week, the wonderful Steve Tanner has joined us. For, we're going to have a little bit of fun this week, as always, with our topic. Because we, um, we're we delving into some certain sort of styles of comics and uh, genres, etc. We're, we're having like almost ongoing genre months without it actually being a genre month at the moment, aren't we? We're just picking different things. Yeah. Um, and I almost, I almost played with the idea of get, getting other people to do the intro this Hey, this, this this week, so that listeners be go, be like, what is this? This isn't right. This is yeah. some kind of Elseworld podcast, and you'd be right because this week we're we're talking. That's what it is? We're talking about those alternate stories, the what ifs, the Elseworlds. What other name? There's there's other sort of. They're they're the two sort of. Yeah, they're the two sort of the two um, main names for they? them. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. But basically, they're they're alternate stories aren't they there are ta- hmm. alternate timelines you know what if this happened what ha- that happened obviously across the big two and more um we put a shout out to our uh, to the social media and got a lot of responses because there's a lot of these books out there so we'll, we'll talk about them as well and we're um, gonna have a go at doing some of our own yeah ones. this has been yeah D- dan posed us a question uh, didn't you dan and we'll come back yeah. to it in a bit we won't start off with that because we'll talk right. about the actual genre itself um but yeah, I, I'm still scratching my head on it at the moment. Oh, me totally. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I might just just pull something out the pocket. I've got one for you. Yeah, wait for Tony's one. So yeah, can... yeah, yeah. Um, but I think Steve, you, as as we know, you're you're an old school comic book reader. Been reading comics your whole life. How do you feel about those sort of alternate timeline stories, the what ifs, etc.? Are you a fan of this sort of genre of storytelling? Yes, yeah, some of them certainly, but I mean, you could argue that every single um, comic is an else world because it, it's all, it's usually de- dealing with something that's removed from from our own world. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I think what if is that was probably the one that I I remember the earliest one, 
um, yeah. when, when they started reprinting them in in uh, Marvel UK. Um, and, and I think the, for the first series of What If, um, and I think certainly the first you know 20, 30 issues, they were really, really clever. Um, and I think as, yeah. as, as it went on, they, they, they started getting a little bit more kind of um, desperate when it became, you know, what if... Yeah, I, th- I think the if. trick for that first series, and I love that first series, man, like you, they had some crackers in there, is they introduced it with almost like a Crypt Keeper thing because they had Uatu, didn't they, the Watcher, yeah. Yeah. come in. And he, you'd get like a little summary of, you know, it'd be like, what if the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man joined the Fantastic Four? So the first few pages would be what's happened in our sort of comic timeline that we knew. And then he'd say, but what if this happened? And it would almost be like that long before it happened, a sort of sliding doors moment that would lead to something else. And yeah. there were some crackers in there. Really and, well. and I think some, some of the other the real kind of, the, I guess the obvious ones, but the really ones that you wanted to know about, like what if Spider-Man joined the Fantastic Four? Um, yeah. And what if, what if Captain America wasn't, you know, it didn't end up frozen. Um, but one of, the, one of the ones that I remember was, was a really good one was, um, I think, what if, um, what if, the, the, the Marvel bullpen with the oh, I love that bullpen. yeah and that was just really that was just really entertaining I remember that and that was that was Jack Kirby with Mike Royer I think inking wasn't it yeah, I so, mean, what, yeah it was, so, so what was this what was this plot of this one the about the bullpen well in, instead of um instead of um Reed Richards and 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 the gang um getting hit by cosmic rays and developing fantastic four powers it was um Stanley and Jack. Yeah. <laughs> I've got it in front of me actually. Here. I, I think Flo Steinberg was in there. She, she was, was, yeah. So, wasn't she? What if the Fantastic Four were the original Marvel bullpen? And he's, uh, Stan was uh, Mr. Fantastic. Sol Brodsky, who was the Marvel VP, he was uh, the Human Torch. He, he had Jack, obviously, was the thing that's going to happen in it with the cigar. And Invisible Girl was Flo Steinberg, who was kind of office manager, looked after Stan, kind of, you know, sort of. You know, hit behind the scenes hero of Marvel, really, in many ways. And yeah. Jack wrote it and drew it. And it, Mike Royer, who was his sort of regular ink at the time, inked it as well. And it's gorgeous, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. yeah but it really was one of those things, but it's such a daft idea, but really entertaining. Yeah. And I think, as well, it really was kind of encapsulated what the, the kind of um, the self deprecating tone that Marvel kind of tended to be anyway. Um, I, I, I couldn't really see that kind of that DC putting out something similar at the same time um, because they, they, they always, DC always seemed a little bit more, more serious. Um, but I remember that, that what if was, was a great one, but of course the, the other El- the Elseworlds one uh, I really remember was not actually a, an Elseworld when it first came out. They retroactively called it an Elseworld was the, uh, the very first one that all turn up one that DC did, which I think was the, um, the Gotham by Gaslight, the Batman one. Yeah, so oh, they retroactively yeah. said that was the first Elseworlds, didn't they? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. And that's um, a cracking book. Really is good. That's yeah. Mignola. Is that is that Mignola one? Is that yeah, on the art. One? Yeah, he does yeah. the art. Yeah, it's yeah. Brian Augustine writes it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a great... Um, it's Batman versus Jack the Ripper, basically. Yeah, you did yeah. a Never Iron anything. Yeah, it's episode, really good. Me and Al. Yeah, really it's a cracker. Mm, good episode, that one. And, uh, so they, done a, they did an animation of it, which ain't too bad, actually. It's all right. It veers off a okay. bit from the, the comic, but it's, uh, yeah, not too bad. I don't know about you guys. I've kind of lost my taste for uh, animation from Western comics. I just, yeah. I was a bit so so by it, but now I'm just not even interested in it. Yeah, I only watched it because of that episode, to be fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not kind of like in a, a degrade it or denigrate it, but that's the same for me. Mm. And yeah. I th- a lot of those, um, a lot of these sort of Elseworlds, what ifs, if we're going to stick to the main two to, to start with, I think where they begin to sort of falter is like you can try anything but as with comics people only want to read about the the big names that they know don't Mm. they really so you end up just getting a lot of what if spider-man picked up the hammer yeah or what if clark kent was batman yeah i mean and then it's just it's just it just becomes a cycle of just the main characters doesn't it do you think that's yeah that can sometimes I actually think when it started, it was quite fresh and I enjoyed it mm. because you knew when you read it, it was a one off. You didn't need to be, <coughs> and you were familiar when, you know, almost yeah. on friendly terms with a lot of these characters, you know. And there's no you repercussions, as in yeah. everyone could die and it's, yeah, it doesn't it was, stick. It was cool like that. But I think, as with it, I mean, I know I was telling you guys before, but in August of 2000, 2003, DC editor Mark, Mark, uh, Mike Carlin told an interview that they were, they were walking away from them for a while. Because they've been overused, and I think he wasn't wrong there. Okay, I think we saw too much. I think you were saying, Dan, weren't you? That I think Batman met virtually everyone, didn't he? Houdini, 
Yeah, you know, everyone. Uh, just, uh, the, we've got the the wiki up here of like the who Batman has has and hasn't met, and like it's so long. Is the the Batman entry is like a more than double the, the the next the nearest one, which is Superman. Yeah, and uh, yeah, there's there's not many people throughout history he hasn't fucking bumped into. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's I mean you know it's like Superman versus War of the Worlds. You know Superman becomes a werewolf. It was well Batman does this. You know it was everything at one point when he. Well, I think. Uh, being an old school reader like you steve you probably remember stuff i mean action comics and you know um super friends and world's finest and all that sort of thing were kind of often else words anyway because you get like i mean that allegedly the first else world was um action comic 60 from 1943 which is lois lane becomes superwoman hmm. yeah. you know and there was all these blurbs that said not an imaginary story but they all were weren't they yeah you know yeah. Well, I think as well, and then you start looking at the the, the, the things like the the sort of the strange too, like Superman versus Muhammad Ali, and, and yeah. all those all those kind of things. And, and, and you know, there's, there's the the Superman um, meeting Spider Man. Those first yeah. ones before, before it became uh, more of a regular thing. They were all these kind of elsewhere story, but they were they were they were kind of they were kind of fresh ideas. And I think I think as it went on, it became more about the brand rather than the story. Um, and, I, and I think with What If, I think I think they they relaunched it now. To, three or four times probably uh maybe more yes. and, and it started it's, I think it's actually i looked this up i think it's 13 times yeah what if black widow broke a heel it's, it's that kind of stuff you know <laughs> yeah um it, it's stuff we, we, which is not really going to be that um that earth shattering in the first place i think and then trying to write a story around it that, whereas really you know the best ones were when you could tell that the the, the, the concept came first and then they thought, well, that's what yeah. Mm. yeah it makes me wonder how the process works for when they're going to do what uh what if do they say right we're going to approach these couple of writers or they say right we've got an up, another series of what ifs we're going to take pitches because it feels very much like uh, i put us on the spot by all of us coming up with a what if yeah. pitch yeah i found it very difficult i've, I've, I've come out with yeah. one that i'm quite pleased with um <laughs> <laughs> well, i think you find in the early talking. the early marvel stuff as well i don't know if you found this Steve, but when you read a what if, more often than not, it contained art and writing by the regular team. Yeah. So the Master of Kung Fu one had the regular team, but the Conan one had um, Roy Thomas writing with John Buscema and Ernie Chan on arts. You know, like you say, the float, you know, the Marvel ballpen one was Jack Kirby, as he'd done the FF before. You know, they often kept to us, I think the Hulk one had Herb Trimp. They kept a sort of similar team. So it was almost like, recognizable to the eye but had that different change mm. of pace in it which they didn't do so much in elseworld yeah then. and, yeah. and I, th I think the other thing i remember about the, the early watches and again this might be memory playing tricks is that although although those kind of alternate kind of um kind of proposals about different formats of you know different people being spider-man you know, like kind of yeah the, the the what if stories always seem to end quite tragically <laughs> yeah um, they did didn't they yeah or go uh, back to the status quo somehow yeah 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 yeah, yeah 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 so, so it was almost kind of like at the end of the day, they were saying, well, you know, the, the actual, the real, the real version is the best version because yeah. you know, if we go this down this other route, it would just be, it would just be upset. And okay. But that, that's, that. I think that ties in, sorry, Dan, I think that ties into what, one of the problems that they have with it that these days. Um, because it seems to be there's a real concerted effort to create a, the next Gwen Paul or, or something yeah. that is an alternate yeah. thing, but if it's popular it can be its own exactly IP. They, they test they yeah. test the water and if it's oh this is actually popular we'll bring it we'll fold them in somehow yeah uh, and that's yeah. like like for instance an old man logan loved that i loved that that story when that happened it was it was it freshened up a character that for me wasn't fresh at all it was old cabbage <laughs> um, but that old man logan loved that sort of idea and then they just ended up weaving him and that was post origins when it when they essentially this yeah took wolverine out to the woods mm. and fucking shot him in the back of the head for me at least <laughs> like, you know what i mean you, you want wolverine as the man of mystery you don't want to know yeah. his backstory and as soon as you do you kind of like break an element of the character well yeah. for me at least yeah i, I didn't want him they, I didn't they, want had, him they did an interesting trick of like because they pushed it forward a certain amount they could introduce new mysteries for the reader to discover as the story went on and i think for a lot of characters if they went once there's no mystery once you're not wondering what's going on yeah it became do you ever read the one that john cleese did do you ever read that one the superman one no what well, oh, superman was from right. london or something well well we'll get into i tell you what that's quite a good segue into yeah. some of the ones that uh while we're talking about some of the big two we um we 
put a shout out to the social media. Yeah. And we said, what ones do you like? Do you have any favourites, any that work well, or some something you just didn't like? Um, Matt Simmons, at Sherrick Freak. The What Ifs I always enjoyed as a kid were just the ones where loads of characters died. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and that's become a trope with Marvel, isn't it? Such and such kills the Marvel Universe. Yeah. Um, it's not a what if, but Age of Apocalypse was a huge obsession for me. Oh, I feel yeah. you, brother. I feel you. Um, I ranted about that last week. I think Age of Apocalypse. Uh, complete redesigns of characters and relationships, followed by most of them dying, uh, <laughs> with an amusing gift that you have to look in the Twitter thread. And as Tony mentioned, then Stuart Mulrane at Token Nerd, um, he said, "I was really looking forward to this one, and it was a massive turd." The story was weak and the jokes just didn't <laughs> land for me at all. This is Superman, True Brit. Yeah, which yes. is Kim yeah. Howard Johnson, John Cleese, John Byrne, Mark Farmer, and Alex Blayart. And there's a picture, basically, uh, Superman. As it says, in this very British tale, that already got my back up. It's like somebody who wrote the Carry On movies. Yeah, you know, wrote it. It's a bit like that. You yeah. guys have read this. I've not read this one. Yeah, 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 I haven't read it, but just see if you want to read it after this, Dan. In this Vedu British tale, the last son of Krypton's rocket ship crash lands in an English town, even smaller than Smallville, where the infant Carlel is taken in by ado- by adoptive parents, the Clarks, who raise their son Colin to hide his powers because the worst thing anyone can do is stand out from the crowd. But when Colin grows up to become a mild manner reporter working for the Daily Smear... A powerful tabloid newspaper dedicated to uncovering the biggest story of the century, he finds that the key to his success may actually be to go public. Yeah, it had such potential. Hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's actually almost so bad it's funny, that one. You said it's played yeah. for laughs. It's not taken. It's it not kind of is. Yeah, yeah, but it's almost like a 1960s 40 ta- uh, a 1960s Monty Python yeah. sketch made gotcha, of Superman. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like that, yeah. You're saying there's a guy with a cricket bat smashed through his chest and he, he becomes Batman. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's right. Uh, have, you, have you read this one, Steve? Um, I, well, I, I've, I've got it somewhere, but I can't actually remember anything about it. Yeah. Probably said <laughs> yeah. how much, how bad it is. Because usually, if, it, if it's something is good, you kind of remember it, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It uh, reminds me of uh, I was reading I read a Batman one years ago, and I only just remembered it uh, when Batman is Superman uh, lands in Gotham. He, he becomes Batman, and it ends up. I just remember it's ridiculous. The last panel ends up him like realizing he's actually a good person he's flying around the city in the superman costume so where did this come from you've been murdering yeah. people throughout the entire story and like surely you're the product of your environment you don't have this innate goodness that so actually you mm. know what i was wrong i'm gonna stick on this blue and red suit and fly around and call some <laughs> superman. Yeah. yeah we've got a couple of uh, other honorable mentions john away uh who's <laughs> social media He's, he's now, he's now he's Jack now the Ripper. Jack, yeah. Jack, well, it looks like Jack the Ripper on his social media. After the amalgam... That's a genuine when, photograph. When my two favourite uh, superheroes became one merged, not banged, Wolverine and Batman became yeah. Dark Claw. Dark yeah, Claw. I liked that amalgam yeah, like that. thing. Yeah, it was all right. What's, is that in, in that canon? Because I can remember the, the, the character... I can't remember the name. There was that chap and he could speak to both sides of the universe. He's too big. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm not sure if that story is actually canon or not. No, this is the amalgam know. stuff, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. There was some. Dave Gibbons did one, didn't he? Some interesting yeah, designs. Was that, yeah. Wasn't that Captain America Superman mashup? That's, that's the right, one. Yeah. 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 Super Soldier was that the one? That's oh, right. Yeah, I think that's yeah, yeah. yeah, that was. There were crazy times when that was happening, wasn't it? Just imagine yeah. if that had actually printing, taken off. Printing money, weren't they back then? Yeah, yeah. Um, the Mega City Book Club. Whatever happened to the Man of Tomorrow is a great one. Yeah. Um, good animal. That's a good one, yeah. Yep. Uh, Stuart Mulrain again. I remember really enjoying a lot of the Elseworld annuals that DC did in 1994. Um, I think uh, some of that. That's the one with the Mignola covers, isn't it? Yeah. Is that right? Yep. 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 Seemed to be from the covers that he posted. There's an awful lot of Superman and Batman going on. Who'd have thought? Nice surprise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Dave Robertson, years ago, I was excited to see there was a comic called What If the Hulk Went Berserk? However, on reading, it was disappointing. I don't suppose anything could live <laughs> up to that title. <laughs> I thought that was what the Hulk was meant to be. Yeah, that's, that's the yeah. standard. Yeah. Dave does love the Hulk. It's his favourite character, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and was, got, wasn't it gone. just before... Wasn't World War Hulk just before Planet Hulk was when Hulk just went mental? That was and they, after. After Planet Hulk, yeah. He came back, didn't yeah. he? Because they banished him, didn't he? And he came back for revenge. Essentially, uh, uh, yeah. that, that the council, the four of them, blew up 
the planet Sakaar, and he was like, uh, "I'm pretty fucked off." So he goes back to Earth to uh, yeah, quite rightly, yeah, John Romita Jr. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I really liked the Planet Hulk, but the War World Hulk. You, you were supposed to be on the kind of the Hulk side, and at the end of it, I was like, oh, "He's been a bit of a twat." Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's where he he. he... He almost the, the Black Bolt thing. I know it's not actually Black Bolt, isn't it? It's someone who'd taken his place, but the Black Bolt looks that fight between them looks amazing. Yeah, the whole yeah. fucking fighting in that is just yeah. Was that when uh, you have yeah. that brilliant panel of like uh Hulk saying to Black Bolt, I want to hear you scream or yeah, something like that's that? One. Maybe, yeah, that's yeah. Fucking yeah, brilliant scene. Uh, anyway, uh, Rob Hard- Hardingham said, Really enjoyed this at the time. Beautiful art from Cuba, worth it just to see Spider Man in a rough. This is 1602. Which are, oh yeah, yeah the that no gaming a, thing. Yeah, yeah, that was a because that was a sort of an out of the blue. I mean, it's a Marvel Knights one, but um, I remember they a, announced that, didn't they? About really early, and everyone's trying to work out what sixteen oh two meant. I remember there being a rumor in Comics International that it was the shape of the page or something. Even yeah, oh, okay. you know, the measurements of the page, all sorts of things were being. Do guessed you remember? At, yeah. I think it might have been fan art or unofficial art. Someone did like a Spider Man Vietnam. It oh, might have been a okay. fan comic. It wasn't Jim and, Marfood? Was it? I'm not sure, but I can right. remember like a, a a kind of spread someone did with like Spidey, like with the kind of the camo gear and with the mask. Wasn't that Brendan like, McCarthy thing? Was it? I'm not too sure. Yeah, I thought okay. that sounds like a nut storyline. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is there uh, any that kind of stick out for you, Steve? Like, um, the the, the one that I remember was um, the 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 J. Michael Straczynski one, which is the squadron. He did, he did the yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Which was always a sort of alternate universe for Marvel, wasn't it? Which yeah. is where they basically remade the Justice League. Didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I thought that was that, that. There's a lot of stuff in there that was very good. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think it was the core title, and then they had a few spin-offs to it as well. Um, yeah, Supreme Power was the Max story, wasn't it? Which was really Power, nice. yeah. Gary Frank, yeah. I think. Didn't it? Yeah, it yeah. kind of just petered out, didn't it? I really, I was really enjoying. Yeah, it. yeah. Mm. yeah. Good Acey did a series, didn't he? Didn't he do the. He did. He did a sort of mini series as well. He it comes back occasionally, didn't it? it? Came back during the War World stuff, you know, when they sp- they split all the universe up. Right. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that was all right. Um, okay. Lee, Gr- Lee Grice uh, mentioned a bunch of the ones that we've um, already um, already mentioned, but um, but a couple that we haven't mentioned. DC: The New Frontier was one of them. Yeah. Um, Batman: The Dark Knight Returns, which I think Fair play. is, is yeah. a very a very good example of it because that doesn't. That doesn't fit into anything, does it? That's its own. No. Isn't thing. it in the future, though? It like, is. It's, but they say it's, it's in the future. Batman's about 50, isn't he? Yeah, but mm. also it's a future that Quite doesn't young. that doesn't really marry up with anything that's happening now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, as time goes on, it becomes more and more in Elseworlds. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Will it become yeah. one? Yeah. Mm, it's yeah. a funny one as well when they did Kingdom Come and they sort of like... I think you yeah, mentioned was, this. Yeah, they, they marked it as like oh, here's an endpoint for the DC universe, and then you start to see elements of what was in that book creep into the comics. It's like oh yeah, that became canon, didn't it? Yeah, because you um, got the the kingdom, which was the sort of followed it up, yeah. then became part of it. And didn't um, Jeff Johns include some of the characters from that in his JSA run as well? Yeah, you, you've got to yeah. be careful because if you're looking at look, this is an endpoint. This is a mark a, a mark on the road, and then you all say right, we're going to start traveling towards that, and you start bringing these elements into your story you kind of for me you're rail railroading yourself towards that now and then yeah. they didn't did they they kind of just oh well fuck all that we'll just do something yeah. else yeah, yeah. did odd. you ever read the golden age by james robinson and oh yeah that's very good that was really good wasn't it that was almost watchmen good i think that was yeah it's like really? it's as if as if the jsa heroes like post-war were caught up in a version of McCarthyism. Oh, okay. Like that. Yeah. yeah, Robot Man. And there's some really interesting characters they use. I think Liberty Bell's in it from the top of my head. Um, Johnny Quick, all these sort of characters. It's a bit, it's a bit like um, um, the, the sort of, I suppose, the JSA, but, you know, all of those characters that were cool at the time. And James James Robinson is a, is a much underused writer, I think. He's really mm. good. Yeah. Mm. Is uh, Watchmen, a, would you consider that yeah. an Elseworlds title? I think so. Yeah, it's a separate universe, isn't it, in DC? Yeah. Yeah, but like it was made, it presumed because uh-huh. more uh, famously wanted to use proper DC characters. Say yeah. proper. It was the Charlton yeah. characters. He wanted yeah. To use. Well, it started oh, off okay. as DC characters, didn't it? And then it went then to Charlton. He, yeah. Is it they, Dawn they, of Dawn of? Is it Death Dawn of the Superheroes or something like that? It was called Dusk of the Superheroes. Because he wanted. Like uh, was it the, the question was going to be uh, Rorschach, and uh, I'm not sure he wanted as Night Owl. 
Was Ma- Peace, Peacemaker I mean, was in there, wasn't it? Yeah. Because DC acquired the Charlton characters and then didn't really know what to do with them. Yeah, so, um, that's right. So with that Impact comic yeah. thing, didn't we, for a while? Yeah. Oh, but that was afterwards, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. So um, his, his original proposal was to use the Charlton characters, um, but then um, they thought it was just too radical, and, and and they thought, well, if we if we use use the use the characters in this way, we'll never really use those Charlton characters ever again. So they asked him to um, to kind of reinvent them. Um, so so you know, the, the the comedian was 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 originally the peacemaker, um, yeah. and um, you know, so all the all the characters had. had were based on on the Charlton ones, um, mm. but I, I don't think they ever really did anything amazing then with with the Charlton characters. Anyway. Uh, uh, so oh, we had the Impact line, which was what three years worth of comics, wasn't it? And then they added a couple in there. We had I the fly, in there, didn't we? yeah, mm. and the comic. was that the one where you had the fly, black mask, yeah, shield? yeah, you had the sh- yeah. Legend of the Shield, you had Jaguar, yeah, and then you later on you got another. I'm going to say about 2010. Maybe just before that, you had that red circle where they tried it and it only lasted like a year. And that had the web and a couple of other comics. Oh, I remember track. the web. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have to revisit some of those comics. So I do have them all. Yeah. They were quite decent, as I remember. Yeah. Quite solid. I think the impact stuff was for slightly younger readers, wasn't it? Yeah. As I remember. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I did struggle with it at the time, but imagine that comics for, younger re- <laughs> comics for younger readers. Who yeah. would have thought it? Um, <laughs> There's, there's one that um, Pete Dory mentioned. Um, he said it's well, genuinely one of the best ever Conan stories. What if Conan the Barbarian walked the earth today? Yeah, I've just it's, reread that today, actually. Yeah, that's a good story. And does it yeah. hold up? Yeah, it really does, man. The art is brilliant. Uh, only chan over, top, over the top of John Buscema is gorgeous. I absolutely love it. Mm. Yeah. Um, Rob Turner at Reynard City I remember reading Amalgam and loving the wacky idea of DC and Marvel characters smooshed together my personal fave is Citizen Wayne from the black and white anthology which is Batman's origin in the style of Citizen Kane I feel like I need to read this now okay. uh, what, what would you say you... instead of Rosebud we know Martha Rosebud was, yeah. um, I imagine that you came up with a title and then retroactively made the comic hmm it's got to be. Yeah, yeah it's got yeah, to be, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's War of the Worlds. Ah, yeah, yeah, Superman. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Cliff Cumber, um, la- last one. Cliff. Cliff. Oh, sorry, Cliff. Oh, you, you, you're a mouthful. Um, <laughs> Red Sun was one of the best Elseworlds story, in my yes, opinion. From that doubt, that's definitely yeah. in the top three yeah. for me. But I also enjoyed Batman Legends. And here's a more recent one that I think is one of the biggest ones now. He says, my son is a big Injustice fan. And I think Injustice is a good example. Is that a video game one? It was the it's video game, which, well, which yeah. then Tom Taylor ended up writing the series. After, yeah. Didn't he? Which is still going. And yeah, it's, a fantastic, that. it's a What's fantastic the premise? video. It's, it's basically uh, Lois Lane dies, Superman goes mental, and the things that happen after. And Superman is basically the big villain of the world. Okay. It's, it, okay. it doesn't sound that original when you say it like that, but in the games and in the books, it's really well done. I think that's why it sticks with a lot of people because yeah. it's just well made. It's just well written. I presume all the, the heroes and villains go to various sides. Yeah. Jo- uh, and I think Joker's responsible for it. And one of the first things Superman does is he puts his fist through Joker and Batman tries to stop him. Uh, yeah. yeah. Not, not like. Not not, I'm, not I'm, Fisto style. Yeah, you got to read no. it for yourself, Tony. I'm not going to if you to find out. I own where, it, where it my out. son bought me it, and I haven't yeah. read it yet, so yeah. I must. Uh, so yeah, yeah. It's good I can fist but, them all, he man. Yeah, <laughs> 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 I really want to fist Skeletor. Um, <laughs> now, obviously, we've been talking a lot about the the Marvel and DC ones, but I think another fascinating example of Elseworlds and these sort of stories. Um, and you found it with a lot of I, I find like UK British ones, and these are, are titles that aren't necessarily ones that I've read, but certainly I've talked and I've talked to people that have said, "Oh, you should read this one." There's a lot of like UK comics and probably 2000 AD where it's like, "Oh, and it reimagines like World War One, but aliens invaded and things like that." There was lots of things like that, isn't it? There's lots of existing yeah. sort of British stories. Um, are there any that jump out to you? that were fast alternate takes on history mm. i think i think which is popular with with a lot of more british science mm. fiction creators don't you think steve what, do you, sh- what, what, do, what do you think I, th- I think i mean being a historical man <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah I, I think i think um i think 
I mean, this this goes back with things like if you look at the World War Two, some of the world stories, and you see things like um, the um, Sarge Steel, um, you know, the 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 the, the Steel Commando, those mm. kind of kind of kind of characters um, who who feature in. In, in a lot of British comics titles. Um, I think it, a lot of it was about giving, making things a little bit different to what people had actually experienced. Because a, a lot of the time, certainly in, in the, I think the war comics of the 60s and 70s, um, the World War II itself was, was actually in, in not too far in the past. So I think for, for many people, it, it was kind of quite real. So I think some, sometimes having these kind of um, outlandish characters um, in the stories was a, prov- provided a little bit of escapism. Beyond. I liked, um, yeah. similar to what you're saying there, mate, Fiends of the Eastern Front, which had World War II reimagined where one of the, the battalions was vampires. Yeah. I think that's a good one, you know. Yeah. 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 Um, it's such a but, simple by- byline, what, you've <laughs> what you just yeah. said, Tony, but immediately yeah. I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, they brought it back for a bit, didn't they, recently? <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, what were you saying, Steve? Yeah, so I think there's it, always there's always been this kind of um, tendency for for kind of certainly for British comics to have these kind of um, alternate takes on mm. um, on on historical figures, um, and I think that's something which you know it, it just seems to be a very popular thing thing to the kind of um, yeah. I think if you don't have like a like a big banner name to play with. And certainly, you know, the, the amount of like, I mean, there's novels that have written alternate takes on like, you know, what if Hitler did this instead of this? Yeah. How would that affect that? You know, what if we didn't win the Second World War? That kind of thing. Um, you know, there's been lots of play in it. And I, 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 do you think from a writing perspective, it's, there's still a lot to be mined with this sort of genre? Or do you think the world is sort of, Unless it's like bigger characters, the world doesn't want to read about. Them. I think if I see a novel that says the alternate history of you know an alternate history of the moon landings or something, I'm like, I oh, really, <laughs> and it doesn't doesn't grab me anymore. I don't know why. I think I think there's certain kind of um, aspects of history that have been overused, and they're kind of a bit a bit turned mm. off. So I know that there's a there's a huge kind of um, genre in 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 America for um, alternate takes on on the war of independence and 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 the um the confederate you know the american mm. civil war um so there's lots of kind of novels to do with alternative uh timelines to do with the, the, with, the with the american civil war um but i think that there's always going to be um opportunities to kind of to, to, to mash things up and take things in a different direction because that, that's what storytellers do anyway you know you, you kind of look at look at you, you you're inspired by 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 by, di- by different things and and you make something new out of them and you know with history there, there's there's thousands of years which you can kind of take particular inspirations from um and and kind of weave it in in, in an alternate way i mean so is that, I, is that it, something that you've like because obviously with like things like flintlock and the clockwork cavalier and, and things like that you're dealing with very real existing historical time periods but then when you're writing your work does it these sort of fantastical uh creations sometimes how they affect that time period do you do you think oh does that produce more interesting things for you to write about yeah, yeah it can do and but the, i mean i mean in particular it's probably the the, the clockwork cavalier character from the flintlock ones or oh, i mean yeah. all, all the all the other characters in the in the appearing in the in the flintlock stories are all very very grounded and and that they're all you know they're all very much um based on um how Pe- people in history in those particular roles w- would have would have be- would have behaved. Um, the the Clockwork Cavalier is, is the most out out there one. But again, that was that was kind of in, in partly inspired by things like Robert Archie um, and 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 the Steel Commander. Those those kind of kind of characters. Um, and I, and I think that the, the thing is was how you use those characters in a way that kind of fits in the period, but doesn't jump the shark. And and, and yeah. that sounds that was really kind of kind of a, a kind of strange thing to say because you, you, you're basically with a clock cavalier talking about a clockwork man who couldn't have possibly existed at that time in the 18th century. Um, but even that was with you know the cavalier was with the, the one of the inspirations was, was the Turk 
who who you guys may have heard of, who was actually a real um, clockwork man that toured um, toured the the eighteenth century, uh, he, uh, the, uh, the palaces of of, of, of of Europe, um, and what it was, he he, he was sat at a um, a, 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 a table. And um, he would play chess against the various kings and queens of Europe, and he would always win. And it was a sensational kind of thing that happened. And you, you know, you, you, there's, you can find him, look him up on Wikipedia and stuff. So it was, this was a real, real thing that actually existed in the 18th century. The oh, Turk. Wow. Um, and now it turned out it was an elaborate hoax, of course. But the, but one of the things with with the cavalier is what if it wasn't a hoax? What if there was a, a real clockwork man um so so it's getting he's using that character and kind of tying him into to the the uh, the flintlock timeline which which is based on the real history of those 100 years um but at the same time because the the, the kind of character he is because he is a bit fantastical it means then you can then um you can move into a slightly more um otherlandish setting which is which so so the the, the story he appears in, in 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 the clockwork cavalier special um which was kind of a, a standalone story which which i guess is a flintlock spin-off the yeah. tone of that story and the style of that story is very much much more um it's not steampunk it's actually clock punk because clock punk is the period <laughs> before steampunk yeah um so so you you can do things in that in that kind of story as a standalone which wouldn't work in the main flintlock series Simply because it it just it, it just one one too big a step removed. And do you think uh, that's um, part of the appeal of these sort of Elseworld stories for a lot of writers? Because because there are you know like you say with your Flintlock series, there's the existing rules for want of a better word. You know the, the world is fixed in, in this kind of way. But with the Cavalier, you've got the you've got the opportunity to bend things a little bit bend the rules a little bit to get get it to work and do you think that that was fun to do for this story to, to to take a chance that you to write something that wouldn't necessarily normally work in the existing series oh oh yes definitely i mean and and uh, you know so it, it, it was really entertaining to to do that story and the cavalier is he, is fun to do anyway because mm. because you know I mean, part of it going, you're aware of, of the innate silliness of, of, of what the character is. Mm. Um, and I think that helps. So, so you know, even with his speech patterns and the things he does, they're kind of OTT stories. Um, yeah. and, and that's kind of fun to do because some of the other the, the other stories in Flintlock, because they're so grounded in, 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 in um, reality, um, they're actually they're, they're a lot more difficult to write because you've got to make sure that um, certain everything is, is, is on point in terms of, um, the slang, the setting. Um, yeah, it must be a nightmare, man. That kind yeah. of thing. And, and there's, there's and there, you know, there, there was the one of the things of, and even the, the the look of the of the of the backgrounds, that kind of stuff. I mean, uh, a good example is the is the Lady Flintlock story when the, the original artist um, Anthony Summy he did the first on the first three books of Lady Flintlock. Um, he sent me these 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 pencils, um, and and they were lovely, but then he had to change all the. the all the trees in the background, whenever the, the trees in the forest, because he the trees he had because the story is set in 1751 hadn't in, it been introduced to English forests until, um, <laughs> until <laughs> 80 90 years later. That couldn't have been an easy phone call. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, the, it's, the, it's those little things, when, uh, you know, which I didn't, I, you don't need to worry about if you're doing a kind of clockbook story, but mm. you still have to have uh, a certain the, the world they're in still has to make sense within that environment i think so, i think in some ways a lot of writers like contemporary writers especially if they're doing like an alternate science fiction you know what if aliens invaded during world war Two or whatever they don't really take that into account it's just an excuse to, to do something silly isn't it yeah um which sometimes yeah. less i mean sometimes it's it you know a company gets hold of an ip so they have to do like loads of you I mean it happened with planet of the apes we saw it happen with conan didn't we at marvel you know, they think, oh, well, now I've got this new extra playground. Let's do this with it. We have Conan meeting the black cat and going burgling or something. You know, it's not like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's burgling. not like ever the true ca- the the true Conan, is it? Because you don't know, feel like be, it, is it? He'd be no. after the black cat, like yeah, he'd be banging her out, wouldn't he? <laughs> <Go away>. God, <laughs> what he's about? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what he's about. Watch <laughs> out, Conan's about. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> It'd be burg- breaking in, smashing in the back doors of houses. Oh, then... right. All oh, right, Dan. All <laughs> oh, right. Let me cut you off there. Um, but... He's still there, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Just about. Just Steve about. Cannon has left the call. Um, but that's... <laughs> But talking about um, fun ways to um, do Elseworlds and come up with these ideas, Dan Butcher came up with an interesting uh, task for us, didn't you, Dan? Yeah, I fashioned a rod from my own back and then I <laughs> asked you guys to uh, give it a go. I said, if you get a chance, you got a chance to uh, pitch your own Elseworlds tale and uh, we're going to say them on the show. And uh, I struggled massively. Yeah. Uh, Vince, you said you had a corker. I've no, got one I, too. Yeah, t- Tony's got a corker. I, I you made me promise I'd go first. Yes, yes. T- Tony can go first. Okay, so let me set the scene for you folks. Oh Imagine God. this in your mind's eye. He's got notes. Okay. Wanda Maximoff, the Scarlet Witch, and Jean Grey suddenly appear on a road. Yeah, and they've, they've, they've basically teleported and been thrown out from some sort of multiversal crossover crisis event, you know. And suddenly they find them standing by the side of the road on a pavement um, on an industrial estate in Dagenham. Okay, <laughs> you got this in your mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, they're dressed in their costumes. Maybe they're a bit ripped, you know, um, because they've been in a fight. You know, they're still looking good, though. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> Where's this going? so they're thinking, How, we've got no money, we've got no phones, we've got no credit cards. How are we going to get out of this? I'm worried, Dan. And then <laughs> suddenly passing them is a black taxi. Uh, oh, so they right, flag okay, it down, okay. shush. I'll, they flag it down. It's and, a real taxi. Um, and it's not a real taxi. It's a fake taxi. Uh, so we've got what, the Marvel meets fake taxi. <laughs> what that, if oh, Wanda print, Maximoff print got, some in, money. Got, in, got in the print, fake taxi? Money. Print money. That's a yeah. license. Print money. I tell oh, now. Yeah. God. Why didn't oh, I just God. stop him at the beginning? Yeah. Uh, just is that is was that your whole pitch, Tony? What more do you need? Well, it's got a happy yeah. ending. I'll tell you that now. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! <laughs> Did you say you have another? I had another one. Steve, stop making notes. I know you're going to need this. Oh God! Did you have another one, Tony? No. You put well, all of your effort into that. that. Yeah, that's the cracking one I wanted to take. I mean, first. to be honest, the new it, one you would nick to, be, it. to be honest, it's going to be the one that makes the most money, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you if you think about the the, the bottom line, you make yeah. money on porn up. I don't know how does it work. <laughs> well, that young girl was offering a discount, wasn't she? Too. All right, that's all right, all right, all right. Let, let, okay, let's let's <laughs> let's get into yeah. alternate <laughs> reality stories. Uh, yeah. Dan, have you got one? Well, my initial do, idea was. Do you need another couple of minutes? No, no. Just, just get any popular character and then just gender swap them. And say, look, here's the new, <laughs> what, here's the new. <laughs> what? Oh. That's unheard of. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, my it was. A, I had a rough idea for what if, and it was like back when we, with the start near the, the, the beginning of the Fantastic Four, and uh, Reed Richards perished in the initial uh, incident that caused the Fantastic Four, Ooh. and uh, Doctor Doom has to step in to become the leader of the Fantastic Four. That happened. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> it might not say it has, but yeah. It has happened. Sounds like a good one. Oh, yeah. I heard his heart break. Oh, sorry. That's all right. No, I presumed any any idea you come up with like Oh, that, yeah. Some, most some of the ones we go come up it. with uh, will, will have already been thought up. Unless, Steve Tanner... You can give us one. That's the man with the knowledge. Well, give, it, um, give us it. This, this was this was a challenging one. I'd be perfectly honest. But yeah. I, thought of, I thought of all the the Batman Elseworlds. I thought there could be another type of Batman Elseworlds. Um, because one of the things about that that that's, doesn't seem to change with with any origin story of Batman is is the bat smacking into the window. Mm. Now I've yeah. never ever met anyone. Who, who's, who's ever heard of a bat smacking into a window? But yeah. I've met lots of people, and I've seen it myself where, where a bird and, and yeah. banged into a window. So you got um, that's exactly right. So it's seen. Oh, okay. Mashes, <laughs> into, mashes into the window. Um, so um, yeah. inspires uh, Bruce Wayne to dress in white as opposed to black um, and call himself <laughs> because you know it has to be two syllables. So he can't call himself Seagull Man. Yeah. He can call himself Seaman. <laughs> like where this oh is going. Like where this is going. <laughs> and um, you know, he um 
he, 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 what he does, he, he strolls the, um, he, he patrols on on the um, near the beaches, trying to steal people's chips. Yeah, and, um, and their baguettes. That's yeah. right. I have to point this out to people people not from the UK. Yeah. And um, and um, he get he gets a sidekick, of course. But of course, we have to recognise diversity. So he gets this um, South American lad called <laughs> Bolsac Gonzalez. So it's <laughs> semen and Bolsac, and I think yeah. it'd be great. Um, <laughs> it'd be a great little. You, you can have nice that vinegar, one. vinegar. <laughs> yeah, you can have that one, Tony. Yeah. Thank what you, mate. What the fuck is happening? happening? Do you know, we didn't even speak about this, Minsty. No. We didn't confer. <laughs> Bullsack and semen. Semen St- and bullsack. Steve. I thought you were... I thought... <laughs> You've been betrayed. I thought, I thought... If you keep doing that, he's, semen's going to appear. He, he's not in the ditch with us. He's been in here all the time. <laughs> even they're looking up at us. It's all about knowing your audience, guys. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Very true. Very true. <laughs> Very, he was in. Uh, we know he's in trotters. We know it. Right? Yeah, he's yeah, emerged uh, from the mud wall behind us like Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is spectacular! I don't know how I can fucking follow that up. Um, but the the idea I thought, um, and it's not as filthy as all the other ones. <laughs> That's Mine was pretty straight, but it is. Yeah, yeah. Fair play, Dan. Yeah, and then Tony immediately shot it down. No, oh, no, I didn't mean to. I feel bad now. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't and, feel bad too. Although this is probably <laughs> this has probably already happened, this thing. But I just thought, in keeping on the Batman theme because that's that's generically the one that everyone does. Yeah. Um, my last words would be, what if the Wayne family never existed? Not just what, n- n- what you know, not one of those. Oh, what if they lived? Whatever. What if that just that whole dynasty didn't exist? What does that do for Gotham? What does what does that mean? It'd be quite a calm town, wouldn't it? It would probably, if you think about it, a lot of the time Batman is responsible for a lot of his villains. So a lot yeah. of those villains wouldn't exist. You would probably have they'd probably be superheroes or something that would that would be in the town. You know, you wouldn't the the knock on effect of a Batman. Just think about the ripples that 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 person has created in his life. No. No Robin. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have any of that. Any of the established because of Batman these things happened. No. These pe- what would the what would the life be for like Commissioner Gordon? What would it be? It, it sounds it, a bit like a bit like Dan's favourite one that he's always telling us what they should do, where um why doesn't Batman spend all his money on helping the poor? <laughs> yeah, that'd, yeah, that'd yeah. be the best. No, I don't know why I didn't <laughs> fucking jump to that. Yeah. yeah. We get yeah. a fucking hot take every yeah. week on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially Gotham it doesn't have like a billionaire family looking after it. But then again, what is what is the crime like there? Do you know what I mean? I think uh, if you're gonna ask like, oh, what's an else world that truly asks the question of well what is it like without this person? Just take that that whole family out of the picture and Gotham becomes a drastically different place. Mm. Who knows? It might actually be sunny sometimes. Yeah, it might be better, a better place, generally. <laughs> Probably would be a better place. Yeah. <laughs> so, this car yeah. crashes. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, Bruce Wayne billionaire, that is just a comic that should be made. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 This winds you up no end. <laughs> oh. this, they're kind of like, you know, kind of there's the, the universal hatred of billionaires and people with lots of money on Twitter. And they think having Batman, a fictional billionaire giving away fictional money to fictional car- fictional poor people would somehow solve any problem whatsoever uh, so he's not a billionaire video. anymore is he? he's lost the most of his money isn't he right okay no, he'll, think, get, he'll get yeah. it back give him a couple of years and he'll yeah he will back. yeah dick grayson's richer than him now isn't he because hmm. alfred he? saved a load of money screwed it all away and gave it to him invested it wisely and gave it to him i think this speaks volumes to the fact that tony knows more about what's happening in uh, i think it speaks in, volumes to the drongos that are writing dc comics <laughs> yeah yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> what we if don't, we don't like Batman have... being a millionaire? Let's get rid of it. All right, okay. What should we if do? Well, let's make have... Devitt, Dick Grayson one. Batman's got to go back in time for what else story, and you got to make the worst comic. Who does he go and uh, and see in world history? And it's going to be awful. How awful is that? What? What? So say that. What's so that? like, I I'd come, I'd pitch a story where Batman goes in back in time and meets Mother Teresa. Or <laughs> 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 Is it an erotic comic? Oh, God. No. (laughs) 
I, just, I was just looking at the spine of some of my DVDs, and one I just have erotic someone, with a K. I just have him meet someone like really mundane, like Terry Wogan. Yeah. Yeah, like. Good, I like yeah. Terry Wogan. Yeah. He features yeah. he features in the comic of mine. He's not that yeah. mundane. Yeah. Batman Gandhi. Oh, classic. So, classic. What Batman Steven Seagal? <laughs> uh... I was going to say Batman <laughs> in feudal Japan, but they've done that, haven't they? That's been done. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Wolverine. Yeah. Oh, that was my other one. What if Wolverine didn't exist? But maybe that's just wishful thinking. Yeah. I said it in. What if Gwenpool didn't come exist? at me? Oh, please. Um... <laughs> I still think the gender swapping's got legs. They should try. Yeah, that I think I think time. that's a really good idea, man. Actually, yeah. they should try that. <laughs> they should try that out. <laughs> it's quite. So... It's quite. Uh, there, there's an upcoming. Is it a what? What if the Wolverine one? Yeah, what if Miles Morales is Wolverine or something? Why do they yeah. want to do mess about with yeah. Miles Morales? Talk now? about I, I like that Mar- made my face hurt. I really, I, you know, so I, I love Miles Morales as, as that Spider Man. You know, but I just, it's like, can they not think of? <laughs> yeah, just there's Miles Morales, Captain America as well. Uh, it's like, yeah, why? I mean, Miles Morales is is resp- You know, is in part exists because of the the, the Ultimate Universe. You know, and that alternate yeah. timeline. You know, and he was so good, he transcended it. Um. But yeah, why? But once again, it's just the big companies taking an IP and then watering it down, and then just diluting it to the point where yeah. it's just asinine and bending it over. People Which is like, what they did people with like that. Wolverine. Everyone's got to be Wolverine. No, they don't. Like Marvel Zombies was all right in the first couple of series, and they they proper bent that over, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, that was a kind of classic one and done. I don't think yeah. it, it, you didn't really need anything beyond no. what was tackled in that original Marvel Zombies. Um, <laughs> Then they I've read stories about pitching that, and wasn't it Kirkman or someone said, "Oh, once we did zombies." I can't remember. I definitely read something about it, or someone said something. Okay, and I was like, "Oh, that sounds a fun idea. We'll do that." And because it came out of um, the Fantastic Four Ultimate book, didn't it? That's right, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, really? That's where it started. Yeah. yeah uh, so. okay. Well, they went yeah. to like a world where everyone had turned into zombies. Uh, there was some kind of dimension between the two, or something. I think. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, Fair it's enough. quite good though. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. I remember the covers being really good because they were they were riffs on the really classic. That's Marvel, right. Uh, yeah, Marvel covers weren't they? But with zombied up. Yeah, yeah. Peoples. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, what have we learned this week, folks? Have we I think what if what if we learned something on the AC? What group? if <laughs> what if there was knowledge that was discovered? <laughs> there's definitely. I think there's a definite. Uh, people would want this kind of stuff. But it has to have an interest in the premise. I think you yeah. need the premise before you think, oh, let's just do another what if or, or else worlds. It's a harder sell without um, a name to it in this day and age, I think. Yeah. You know, I think. And for, it was just moment, a bit of fun before. Now it's sort of a whole industry of yeah. what ifs, and you're like a bit yawny around it all. Yeah. 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 And it's just, who knows? Who knows? You certainly, um, I, I can't. Remember seeing these these sort of stories, not fake taxi, um, like on the small press scene. I can't think of. Can any of you guys mm. think of any, any particular? It's a hard you one. You could because, get away with it, Dan. Your yeah, story, I think. Yeah, Vanguard could do it. Trouble is, it's like if I want to do that, that's like six months of my life to explore <laughs> a, a what if story. So it's, yeah. it's it's a long time. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to do like all kind of crossovers of other people's characters and stuff like that, but there's only fucking so many hours in the You've got a crossover day. at the moment, haven't you? The yeah. um, Donny Cates, uh, Chips Zazarski book. Okay. Yeah. That mixes in all different, I mean, all different characters from all different sort of auteurs. Yeah. Auteurs. Interesting. Nice use the word mm, auteur. Yeah. Um, Steve, you've been, you've been on the scene for the nicest ever. possible way. <laughs> <laughs> in the nicest way for. You know, longer longer than I. But um, have you seen any sort of? I, no, I don't think I have. To be honest, no. um, I, I is think it something I, you've considered, or? Um, I mean, we, we've uh, the closest way we, I've come to it is doing. Um, we did um, with Accent UK. We did a kind of a, 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 we each did a, a, a separate print, which we, we, theirs featured their Josiah Black. Um, and and Time Bombs featured um, the samurai character from from the Brawler series, um, right. and, and you could be, you could put them together so it was one big picture. Um, but so, so I've seen stuff like that. I've seen people do kind of um, like 
sh- both characters in, in like a single image and, and yeah. you guys do some big yeah, we did a big, big print poster with yeah. Yeah. Characters mm. in you. um but an actual story so got a few left if anyone wants one <laughs> I, don't <think laughs> I've ever, I don't think i've ever seen a, a, a story um or, or even a comic featuring lots of different characters um from from different kind of small presses whether that's because people who who are working in in, in the indie comics they, they, they they're all working on slightly different things and slightly different rates and you know different kind of projects um so to actually bring them together would be a project in itself um which may be too big an ask um but i think some characters will kind of um that they would they would quite easily fit i mean you know yeah. the stuff that maybe there was there was merrick and uh which is almost a, 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 oh, yeah, true. an alternate timeline, yeah. but that, that crossed over with Dr. Crow, didn't it, Dan? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Merrick itself is a, is an Elseworlds tale. For one yeah, we've, got, word, um, we've got two characters in the tribute verse who may well meet in an upcoming issue. Well, that's um, Yeah, so two different comics might meet. Yeah, we're, we're sort of working on that at the moment. Mm. Wow. Mm. Nice one, yeah. Would you like to see it, folks? Would you like to see some crazy small press crossovers? Oh, we haven't done crossovers as a topic, have we? Like proper crossovers. Mm-hmm. Oh, making out of that. <laughs> um, it can, but, it'd be a bit funny if you did small press ones, because obviously, say you're okay, you get on good terms with a person you're crossing over with, and then two years down the line, they cut up a bit funny, and you've done a crossover. Yeah. they got to be yeah. a bit you careful. You me the money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or so yeah. I just don't want to use using my character anymore. Or Yeah. I think that's why something like the Doctor Crow, uh, Merrick, Merrick is, is, is a good top, one. Yeah, yeah, they had their own versions, didn't they? Didn't they? That's an absolute fucking high bar. That one. That's really yeah. good. Mm. Yeah, but that probably t- took a lot of uh, planning and, and you know actually thinking mm. about it. So, but we don't think about anything on this show. <laughs> Fake taxi. Uh, well, yeah. Stop thinking about yeah. that. But um, but Steve. <laughs> What what is in the future? Not hopefully not fake taxi. And uh, now that you've said seam seam and a ball sack, I don't know where this conversation is going to go. <laughs> yeah, it's um, copyright that. Yeah, but um, what is the uh, the landscape like for Time Bomb at the moment? Um, oh, there's lots going on because um, this is our fifteenth year of going. Wow, wow, oh, nice. Um, which I know, you know, it, it, you know, this week two thousand eight was forty five, so it's, it's maybe not that big. It's still not bad, man. Yeah, it's so, yeah. great, great. Yeah. Yeah. So we got lots of stuff going on. We've got the Kickstarter for Rotten Under the Snow that's currently live at the moment, and that finishes in two days' time. I so back that. Gonna, I'm yeah, a backer. Thank you, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so looking forward to that because that's a that's a, a full length ninety six page graphic novel. Um, so that's good. We've got. Um, I was hoping I'd be able to kind of say more about it this evening, but I can't because it hasn't been fully signed off but we, we got our first licensed book coming out um oh. in um in april may time um uh, so that i'm looking forward to that just a part of it i'm looking forward to see what how people react to it because um we, we, a couple of times over over the years people with licensed properties have come to us and, and asked about it but they never really kind of ticked the boxes for me but this one it's a, it's it's global it, it, everyone in the world will know of it um it, it, it's a huge it's a huge property um it's not like um something that no one's ever heard of or a, or a tv show that's coming out they'll only last one series and then be done it's it's a real big um big licensed property is it celebs so, go dating no no but, but you <laughs> know that's still in the works that, that the yeah. second option you know fingers crossed for that one working on that we saw yeah them. so we've got that coming out but then also we've got um flintlock book six coming out this year wow uh, we got um, the third brawler coming out this year. We should have another uh, bomb scares uh, book coming out this year. Um, another Dick Turpin um, is, is coming out. We got more Harker coming out. So nice. the second part of um, of the Black Hound. Um, and there's a few other things as well, kind of bubbling under. So I, I, when, I, when I sat down and looked at the, the schedule, there's, we've got about eight things that are due to come out over the course of this year. That's good work, man. So, there's a uh, few people who can claim that. So yeah. um, it, it's, it's quite full on. So yeah, so it's busy. It's busy. There's um, it, it, it's great to be busy, but sometimes it's almost you feel too busy. Um, but um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, of course yeah. the shows are back as well. So that so there's factoring all, all the all the conventions back in as well because they seem to come back with a bang. So um, this this coming weekend, uh, I'm going to be at um, at Glasgow, 
for the um the oh you're doing the acme one yeah i'm doing yeah the i'll be interested to hear how that goes man i know yeah, canon yeah. johnny cannon's doing it isn't he in, yeah that's yeah. right so i'm looking forward to that and then of course in 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 later in march i've got the um the megacon in birmingham which is the one which um uh brian cooney took over from mcm of course well we oh okay so so he's taken um he's taken the manchester show the uh the spring birmingham show and i think the island show so he's doing this megacon event so again i've no idea really what that's going to be like because um i'm hoping they'll be ha- pretty much how they do it and of course all the rest of the events as well that's, that's taking place there's a whole load of things that are coming out um so yeah and i got portsmouth and I mean, I mean, Time Bomb are very much like uh, it's very much like Hellbound Media. Like it's oh, uh, it shows you guys are like proper convention troopers, aren't you? With your tables, you know. How many shows do you think? I mean, before obviously the Global Bastard and everything, um, but you were doing how many shows would you do a year? Um, Twenty eighteen was was uh, 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 had the record. I did uh, thirty two. Oh, hell. Uh, I'm guessing you must do quite well of them, man. Then it's, it works. Well, some, yeah. So, so I mean, you know, the the, the big hitters, um, I do really well. So the MCM ones and, and, and the Thought Bubble, um, yeah, they're, they're they're real real big hitters. They they're, they're great. Um, I mean, the, the the year I did 32, that was that was the year I I, I did the the uh, Langochlan one with the guy who was singing um, and twerking <laughs> with uh, with uh, with the robot on stage. Twerking. Yeah, oh it was a very God. bizarre, very bizarre event that was. Um, so, uh, so that yeah, that was a really good, useful because of the of the events I did last year, you could really get a feel of what was working, what didn't work. Yeah. Um, and some shows, I, don't, I, I mean, I, I don't do simply because I know they're not my audience, even though they might be great, great shows. For example, I've never done the lakes because I don't really think that's my audience <laughs> at the lakes. I think it's a great event, um, yeah. but it, it's not. I don't think it's it's you know I think the audience that buy time bomb stuff um, are probably not that in in the same kind. Yeah, of... I can see that, man. I mean, I feel the same way. Like Catford Zine Fair probably wouldn't be certain people's yeah. game, but some people do well. Yeah, is that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. I, th- I think I think a lot of it is, uh, is identifying which shows are right for you, and yeah. then and, and then you know do, doing them and, and being a presence at them. Um, I mean, and because I live in Birmingham. Most Sorry about that. Places, yeah, well, you know, some of um, <laughs> most places are, are, are just a few hours drive away in any, yeah. in any direction. So that makes it a little bit easier as well. It's not. I mean, I imagine it'd be a bit more challenging if I if I lived on on, on the south coast and I would, I needed wanted to go to Glasgow um, or Edinburgh or anywhere like that. Um, so so you, you but you just build up that presence. And the thing about um, the last couple of years without the shows taking place. I'll be perfectly honest. Well, when it first was announced in lockdown, I thought, "Oh shit!" Because it, I mean, the, the 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 shows were a big part of, of of you know what I do and and how I engage with the audience and of course sales. Um, but what what happened then? We, we we had this then influx of then online. So the online sales, uh, and I don't mean through the Kickstarters. I mean just the online sales through the um, through the Time Bomb uh, website. That kept it. That kept us going. So, so we noticed then that big uplift in in hits on on the website and then sales coming through on the website. So, when when we kind of sat down and kind of crunched the numbers, oh, over the you know the, certainly twenty twenty, we ended up kind of pretty much doing almost what we would do in a normal year, but not quite because we didn't have the big hitters like MCM um, right. to, to do. So, so it, it was a real interesting to see that kind of shift. But what's been kind of encouraging is that that online um, you know, accessibility that hasn't dropped. So now we're going coming back into, I guess, a relatively normal kind of environment. Um, although I don't think it'll ever be truly normal. What we're seeing is that the, sh- the shows are coming back. I mean, certainly the four shows I did um, in the last you know, from September to December last year, they were they were huge. They were really really big shows in terms of you know um how, how you know how well we did and and i think people were, were expecting it to be a lot quieter than they were um right. and, and they, seem, they seem to be a lot busier um or or, or they didn't see yeah. they may not may have ha- had less kind of numbers in terms of ticket sales and people through the door but the people who work were coming they seem to be hungry for 
you know, to be back in that con scene and and buying comics again and, and buying stuff from different tables. So that was great. So it, it'd be interesting to see this year how it all how it all kind of balances out. Um, so yeah, it's it, it's been um, it's it, it's been a bit of a roller coaster, but it's kind of nice to to kind of still be here and still and still be doing it. Um, and at the moment, I, I'm now planning. I mean, because there's stuff going on all the time. So we talked about the releases for for this year, but at the moment, I'm, I'm working on stuff for for 2024 and 2025 so you know it's a long-term it's a long-term planning as well which makes which, which part of the fun oh, nice work man and nice because yeah. of that long-term yeah. planning that you've been in the game for this for this long you know you're not you're in it you're in it for the long haul that's what we love about you steve and you love you love comics Oh yeah, I mean, well, I think that's it. I mean, I th- and I think that's let's be honest, that's why all of us are in it, um, yeah. really. I mean, for, for, I've, I've always loved comics since since I since I was you know six, seven, eight years old, um, I, and you know, I, I think it helped that I I, I wasn't in 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 a, in a in, in a family that kind of looked down on comics, um, so so I, I I always used to have a comic bought for me, um, you know, right the way and, and until you know I was. 12, 13, 14, and then you know, I, I would buy them myself with pocket money and stuff like that. But um, I'd, I'd, I'd always have that kind of comic um, in, in the house. And it, it was just a, just a normal kind of thing. And it, it just it just kind of snowballs and snowballs. And then I think the, the tipping point was um, in 1979, um, because it was, I, I remember picking up um, a, a, a copy of spider-man and it was the first spider-man where des skin and he was doing his thing, thing he called it thing called the marvel revolution where he was trying to revitalize the marvel uk titles um so so spider-man weekly it changed its format and it lost its glossy covers it became kind of um all paper but what he also did he also kind of really condensed all the all the pages inside so he he chop up the the existing kind of american pages and reformat them so you'd get about two or three um american comic pages onto one page yeah when he um, sort of landscaped wasn't it? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um and, and and what the effect of that was that you you know it, it take you take you a good hour to read it because you you were you were kind of getting um about four or five um american comics in in, in one hit every week um so and and it was that which really kind of kind of that was that i think that was the turning point really although i'd always been into comics and enjoyed them it was at that point where i suddenly became i guess fanatical about them you know yeah, that was I, I, do you remember they had titans as well didn't they which was the same there was sort of two going at the same time weren't they i always yes. think that the yanks are going to discover them one day because they had extra material didn't they because artists they'd have to get artists in to do linking pages and all that sort of thing and there was quite often like really big long pinups and things in them yeah, i keep thinking right. the americans one day will discover that there's these extra pages that they've never seen so mm-hmm. fantastic four and invaders was in there and all sorts of things wasn't it you know yeah yeah, yeah. but it, it, it was through the, 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 the those marvel weeklies that i first kind of um discovered comics fandom um through yeah. through, through little small ads and, and you know that kind of stuff and 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 then tapping into into that um and it, and it and it was and i think it was the right time it was it was it was the late 70s early 80s so as as i was getting really into comics that's when things were starting like you know crisis this is crisis was happening and then you know alan moore had just started kind of uh, c- coming to the four warrior was was coming out um within a few years there was dark knight there was watchman it was all that kind of stuff so it it, it was just like um you know for a comics junkie it was just a massive massive fix um and i think that that was it really that you know so so by the time i, w- I was 15 i was completely indoctrinated and, and then now it's like the mafia because you can never get out yeah, um, it's still, yeah. 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 But, but then but then i don't want to get out um I'm, I'm quite happy with it um I'm, and i'm quite happy and one of the nice things is just it's just a sense of community which, which is which i mean i, I mean I, I don't know if, if they have that in the other creative industries i don't know because i don't know enough about gaming or music or all that kind of stuff but the, the one thing that seems to be this constant thing in in, in comics is it in the uk and i imagine it must be the same in, in america as well is this sense of the shared kind of love and devotion for the medium um and whether whether so whether you're 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 a, a you know you're, you're reading comics you're, just a, you're a reader um or you're a creator or wh- wherever you are you know th- just the fact that you can all come together and you have this shared common interest 
and you you know you might not know much about the person you that you're speaking to just the background but they can start talking about a comic which they like or recommend and straight away you can be part of that conversation and you can have a really good conversation um uh, and over over the kind of the 15 years I, i've been been doing the time bomb what what's really special is the amount of friends i've made and i, I mean really good friends i don't mean fair weather friends you just see at a show and say hello how are you but mm. proper friends who i regularly keep in touch with um you know and that's that's great it's wonderful and i think that's one of the nice things about it and what's been also been great over the years is obviously when i when i started out um you know and i launched my first comic in 2007 and i'll be honest it was crap it was it was, it was really nicely printed but it was crap but i got so much kind of support even though it was crap um and so much kind of friendly guides and friendly advice and that's been a great thing as well um to the point where over the years i've kind of been been aware that that kind of changed so suddenly i'm the person that i'm happy to give advice to and, and give guidance to and that's great to see as well and so you see this constant kind of turnover of new people trying new things but the, there's all this sense of, of community and, and it's promoted by you guys doing the podcasts the other guys that are doing podcasts all of it um it's brilliant it's absolutely brilliant i love it we can't say further than awesome. that. Oh, yeah i just plucked at my heartstrings yeah. preach preach <laughs> 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 yeah i think um with the uk um I think that there's a certain uh, there's a fortunate element to the community aspect, of especially UK indie and small press, because um, you do realise what a, what a small self-contained little island we are. Um, when when you do go to conventions and you're seeing the same faces, I mean, <laughs> you know, you, you go to Birmingham and you and then you go to Manchester and then you go to London and then you go to somewhere like Cardiff, you'll see some similar faces in all these. But I think um, certainly when we spoke to some indie creators from from the states, especially like the the small press guys, it's harder for them because it's such a big country. Do you know what I mean? So that so you can't you can't do thirty two conventions in a year unless you you've got serious bankroll, haven't you, to to get around and get around the states. Um, but it's it's lovely. But because of online, the community is in touch all the time. So that's what that's what we're in it for. We're in it. We're in it to win it and to build up the community and to let everyone know about the great indie comics that we're about. And it's 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 taken us three hundred and forty eight episodes, but we finally got Time Bomb Comics on here. <laughs> I think I think Steve's been on at a convention before, haven't you? Didn't yes, you yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I always like chat to Steve at a convention, <laughs> even if it's just like just drop by and say, "I love that jacket." <laughs> 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 but now, but now he's just shooting me dirty looks from um, from pubs and making me worried that he isn't actually Steve Tanner, but a bloke that wants to beat me up. Uh, it was so unusual to see him in that pub. It yeah. That was the roughest pub in that town. And I know that's not what, the sort of place it was, that it wasn't that fancy, rough, fancy Tanner will go to. You know, as I like to call yeah. him now. Yeah. 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 Lord Tanner. Well, mm. you know, the, the convention persona and the, the real life persona, they're, they're, they're a bit different, you know? It's a bit yeah. Ego, isn't it? Uh, You've got a lively side, Steve. We know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, he's keeping it real. He's keeping it real. <laughs> Um, but no, you should all um, definitely check out Time Bomb Comics and, like I say, check out your local convention because um, and because you you put like a convention list and stuff on the website, don't you, Steve? On you, you, you update your, yeah. your website. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so we always got. I mean, it, 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 it is nice at their back, you know. It really is nice. Mm. If, if it did feel a long two years of that, yeah. Um, you know, but I mean, so, um, the first one, first one, the first one I did um, after last year. After it was was they did the, well it was the Coventry one. Um, we, oh, we, that's right, yeah. And, and that, that was, was our first really, one back, wasn't it? Yeah. And and it wasn't like the busiest, but it was just a nice little two days, almost like easing you back into it. Um, yeah. And it, but, but you know, I felt knackered at the end of it. And it, yeah. was, it was just an e- you know it was an easy little two days really, but I just felt so kind of like goodness, you know. Like, and then and then the MCM then a month later with we three full days. That was that was um, that was like an endurance. Um, yeah, to get to go from nothing to then four days yeah, is yeah. pretty intense, isn't it? So, me and Dan couldn't do it. Could be Dan. We're, no, we're weak. 
Um, it's a brutal schedule. No, but Steve's a marathon yeah. runner when it comes to convention. He, he knows what he's doing. Did you have a different jacket for every day? That's what I need to know. Yes. Fucking pro. <laughs> Absolute pro. <laughs> uh, and there we go. So yeah, so yeah, so go to the Time Bomb Comics website. We will, of course, put all the links in the, in the show notes, etc. And check out their wonderful books. And thank you for talking about some what ifs and else world comics, Steve. We'll talk about many things in it over a pint in the future. But Steve's going to stick with us for the rest of the show and probably recommend some lovely comics to you, lovely people, later. But before we do that, do we have any shout outs first? I have a shout out. When oh, you go first. Yes. This Friday, March the 4th. The drink in the drawer. The. You've just taken. Sorry, I just stole it. Unbe- unbelievable. I was so excited and you just stole <laughs> it from me. <laughs> what is it? What is it? It's, it? it's, it's, it's the drink and draw. It's the awesome comments podcast yes. drink and draw. Yay. Um, yes, please, please join us. Come along. Uh, Tom Curry at this chucklehead. Get in touch with him. Uh, and it's free and it's open to anyone to come along, talk about some comments, do some drawing, and just chill out. Um, even if you, you know, at the end of a long working week, it feels like everyone's having a pretty hectic time at the moment. So just c- come along. You don't have to drink booze either. Some people just turn up to work. They have it on, have it on the background while they're working on their comics or just writing yeah. or anything. Like don't even have to thing. draw. Just no. Don't even have up. to have your camera on. Just yeah, yeah. sit and yeah. listen if you want. You, you just yeah. turn up and listen. So, yes, Friday, 4th of March. Um, that'll be kicking off. Uh, half seven it kicks off. Um, but, yeah, so feel free to join us. Yeah. It's get get hold of us somehow. You can find us. And yeah, give get, you a link. yeah, get in touch. Yeah. If, you, if you want to know how to, how to join, then, then get in touch with any one of us. And we'll point you in the direction because we'll get the details off Tom as well. Mm. Um, any others? Yeah, I've got a couple. So That Comic Smell Issue 2 is out on the 2nd. Oh, yes. Go to thatcomicsmell.bigcartel.com. Uh, the, the site is live, um, but on the 2nd, the comic will be for sale. Also, Strawjack, um, The Terror of Romney Marsh is a steampunk graphic novel from Keith Page. Keith, um, you will probably know, it's worked extensively in comics, including uh, quite a lot of work in Commando. So this is the first release from Lancaster-based indie comics producer Crucible Comics Press, um, run by our buddy John Freeman. Um, they've got a load of really good-looking books, which John sent me an email about. Um, and the currently, I've just ordered it, Strawjack is available available on Amazon, so you can order it from there. I've seen a copy of it, it looks lovely. So go and get that and um, be on board at the start of quite an interesting little um, project that uh, and a publisher that's coming out now. Uh, a little shout out to Strange Apparitions Comic Shop as well, um, who um, you can find at Strange Apparitions Shop on Instagram. Um, Alex, who's been on the show, runs a great shop worth following on Instagram. So he's always putting loads of great stuff up that you can look and then order from him. So he's definitely um, like a dealer for me. He's always messaging me, he's like, oh, do you want this? How about this? You know, it's like a constant with him. So go and, go and find Strange Apparitions and uh, Buy something off them because they've got loads of great stuff and they're good eggs. Yeah, they're mine. Cool. Dan, you got any? I do. Yes. I've got uh, B Mecca, uh, the Kickstarter. It's smashed through its goal. Uh, it's uh, hopefully a future guest, Jamie, me. Uh, it's a mech kaiju anime manga. Uh, it looks absolutely fantastic. Go check that out on the Kickstarter. Uh, if you back that, you will get your comic because uh, Jamie's quite prolific on uh, banging out Kickstarters. Uh, we've got the... I'm popping up on the Mega City podcast. Hey, I've listened to that. It's a great episode, man. Here oh, you cheers. Go. Thank you. Yeah, I listened uh, to it today. Uh, episode 178, we're talking about Martial Law, the first five, six issues uh, from Epic Comics. Uh, me and uh, Eamon uh, blast the way through that. It's great comic. I absolutely love it uh, I reread it again and saw stuff through in it that I, I hadn't seen before yeah I'm going to be picking the writer's brains next week about Archie Goodwin because I want to hear about him as well oh you know, interesting okay yeah. yeah yeah that's really interesting uh, and we also get a little origin of young Danny B's comic buying habits which I really like man that was great I think yeah. we're going to delve into a little when we was uh, comic buying when we was uh, first getting into manga in the manga months aren't we but yeah as well we will be. Sure. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and I've got a bit of bad news I guess uh, with Viper the second part Viper Soviet Strike I've decided to delay running the Kickstarter because of uh, current world events it doesn't feel like the kind of the right time to put it out uh, yeah. I, I started questioning myself and then as soon as I did that I was like if I'm questioning it I, I don't think it's a good idea to do it yeah I think that's the right thing man yeah. I think yeah. I made the right decision yeah 
So I'm going to delay that for at least good two or three weeks, uh, depending on what happens. Obviously, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, book, the book's all done and ready. It's just when yeah. the time is right, isn't it? So, yeah, and it looks great, man. But yeah. I think, oh, just, cheers, thank yeah. you. Just yeah. not to hurt anyone's sensibilities. I think yeah. no, yeah. The, yeah. there's certain yeah. elements in it that uh, I saw pop up on. Uh, the news today and on uh, on social media and i was like shit i've got elements like that in this book and i thought that's just not yeah whereas your book like is obviously more just fun and entertainment yeah it's just fun still, fiction yeah yeah but yeah yeah very wise um so there you go folks right it's time to uh recommend some comics to you lovely people now and uh it's become tradition on this show for the the guest to recommend something first so steve is there anything you'd like to recommend to our lovely listeners? Well, well, there's two. One of them has already been mentioned, and it's a uh, Straw Jack. The oh, nice. Marsh, because yeah, yeah. My, my copy arrived today um, for, from Amazon. Um, and and it's, it is, as Tony said, it, it's a lovely, lovely, lovely book. Really nice. Um, Keith Page, he's one of the, um, he's one of the, the, the last remaining kind of traditional comic artists, I think, because um, he still doesn't use digital. It reminded me, all due respect to you, sorry to interrupt, for a little bit of a time bomb comic. Well, yeah, it's very much so, I think. I mean, it's yeah. certainly like that the tone of it is something that, you know, because as soon as he announced it, it oh, wow, that, that's right up my, right my alley. Hmm. Um, and, and, it, and it is, it's really good fun. And Keith's a, Keith's a great artist. Um, and then, um, no, so it's, it's, it's good. It's, and they do another one as well. So at the yep. back, it says that they've got a follow-up coming. So so that's recommended, Straw Jack. I think it's only seven ninety nine on, on, on Amazon. It's a nice A4. Uh, it's black and white. It's a really nice package. Um, yep. so that's one. I'll send you guys the Dropbox, actually. You should have that in your emails. Nice oh, one. Lovely. Yeah, I've seen yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. that's great. And the other one, which which you might have mentioned uh, previously, but I think I read it this week, and I think it's lovely, is A Trick of the Light by Ali Fell. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, think, I think again that's a lovely lovely piece of work and i think both the ones i've recommended they're very much in the spirit of british comics gone by yeah, it's a bit like a sort of girls comic misty thing yeah, vibe yeah, going yeah. on isn't it yeah, yeah. Uh, and the artwork is beautiful the story's nice and there's some lovely use of a uh, very occasional bits of color which really enhance the um the storytelling um, and again, that's a lovely piece of work as well. And that, that's also, I think, the A4 size. It's a really nice size. It works well for kind of British comics, I think. So those are two yeah. things which um, I really thoroughly enjoyed and I recommend them to anybody. Good stuff. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Uh, amazing. And uh, who would like to go next? Tony. You've normally got like two each week. I have now. got two. I've got one that's like a very brief mention. Shall I do that? And then I can yeah. Yeah, bookend us. Yeah, yeah. okay. When yeah. You yeah. So I just want to mention, um, I wasn't going to mention this, but a couple of people said they're looking forward to hearing me talk about it. So I thought I'd just give it a quick mention. So it's, as we all know, Boom Studios have got the June license and they've been putting out some books that both Dan and I have been enjoying. Mm. Um, the, the the original series is sort of prequel. And then they did one about Sardaukar, which was a one-off, which was really good as well. So this is kind of a one-off before they get into their next series. And it's called June, A Whisper of Caladan Seas. Um written by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson, who also write the prequel novels, illustrated and coloured by Jacob Rebelka, lettered by Ed Duke Shear, covered by Jeff Deacon. It's got a series of variant covers, one of which by Christian Ward, actually, which I didn't see. Um, but it takes place, so this is really interesting to me, because obviously Dan and I are utter Dune addicts. Yes, uh, love it. It's, yeah. it's just an obsession with us. But this happens during the Battle of Arakeen from the original novel. Um, so the first novel and what happens is there's these soldiers and they with the surprise attack um, by the Harkonnens with the Sardaukar troops sort of hidden in between them um, these this is about soldiers who escape into they're told to go and protect the food stashes so they're water and food stashes hidden in in the wall that surrounds the city um, almost like a shield wall is what they call it so they go up there and they're pinned down by the um, Sardaukar troops on the ground. And it's about, it's basically this story about them being in the cave. Um, the, the power they've got, they've got a light that slightly works and be, it's beginning to die. And they're trapped in these caves and they can't get access to the food stashes because they're through brick, brick walls that they can't get through. Um, but one of them is what's called a jongler. Now, a jongler are from a much, um, from a, a maligned house that was pretty much um, wiped out centuries beforehand, but a few have survived. Now, if you if you know your Dune law, you know that a jongler is somebody who can tell stories, but they imbue them with so much emotion and show so much that it actually 
rises and lifts the emotions and can sometimes kill the people listening to them. But because they're trapped in this cave, um, there's a man and there's a younger man. There's, there's about 10 of them. He's a jongler and he tells a story about the home times when they were in, they were back on their planet and, you know, there were seas and, you know, they'd be, be eating fruit and fishing and riding boats and um, on Caladan. And, you know, it's just, he tells this story that sort of transports people where they're dying of hunger and, and thirst and stuff like that. And it's just, a, I don't know why they called it number one, because it's clearly just a one off, but it's, um it's a really lovely story. The art isn't quite what we've seen previously. It's much more, it's got a sort of more of an instinctual representation or a lot of it's in the darkness of caves and with explosions outside. And it's, it's just a beautiful little story. It's extra long. It's a long, a long issue. I'm not sure how many pages it is, but much more than the normal books. Um, yeah, I recommend it. I recommend it. Any of their June series you can buy. I think you got the hardback, didn't you, Dan? Of the first, the first. Yeah, Tom one. gave me the hardback for that one. Of course uh, he did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's so so fantastic. Three, Loved it. Yeah. So good. Three of them. The first, um, the prequel, a trade house of trade prequel, um, which happens a couple of decades before the the June that we know anyone has seen a film or the recent film knows about. But this this actually takes place within the timeline of the film you will have just seen. Um, yeah, incredible. Really good. Yep, that's my first one. Nice, Dan. Uh, I've got an interesting one. This was sent to me by Tom Shirt from uh, Tom. <laughs> this uh, from uh, that that comic smell, and it's Simon Hanselman's Crisis Zone. Yeah, and I've got this too. This yeah. fucking nuts. Essentially, this is a bit of a time capsule for the start of uh, the pandemic in the lockdown because this he started putting this up on Instagram, I believe, uh, when the lockdown started and we were all kind of trapped in our houses. And he was like, right, I'm going to put some free entertainment out. And he started producing this strip uh, and it appeared primarily just online for free for people to read. And we were discussing it briefly before the start of the show, Tony. I can only read this in little bits. I'm the same man. Yeah. It's fucking like, I, I laugh at it, but if I read it for too long, it's like, bloody hell, this is really I think if you heavy. read this all in one go, you'd become a very twisted and weird person, even more yeah. so than we are. Yeah. It, yeah. Tend, if you don't know kind of uh, Simon's work, he uh, takes the uh, Meg Mog and Al and like, they're kind of like drug addicts, perverts just absolutely just abominable people uh and sort of like meg and mog are in a kind of relationship every every witch has their cat and they're in like in a sexual relationship i don't think i can do justice to how depraved some of the characters are in this <laughs> i really can't it's fucking just out there so it starts off with the series in this book uh the covid19 panic happens they all move into the same house to try and say uh, safe and all the kind of like uh, they all wear masks trying to clean stuff down. Uh, Meg, the witch, is concerned that the uh, the lockdown is going to impact the release of the new Animal Crossing game, but it doesn't. And she ends up <laughs> sitting around the house playing that. Do you remember that when the, the pandemic first started in lockdown? Everyone was fucking playing that yeah. Animal Crossing game. It was like people posting about it online all the time. Mm. And yeah, just nuts. I mean, it ends up with uh, the cat like in a a freeway relationship with, uh, do you remember the nineties comedian carrot top? Yeah. 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 And she ends up like sleeping with him. And then like another witch when he's like rimming the cats, the cats rimming the witch's <laughs> arsehole. And it's like <laughs> fucking hell. Fucking hell. It's yeah. I've, you just, know what? I've, I've just opened a random page and it's got some character called Valeria. And she says, I hate this country. All these fuck boys here. They don't want to fuck. That's just the random panel I yeah. have it on. Yeah. There's one character that's like, it's just an absolute like stick of dynamite any scene and it's called uh, Werewolf Jones. Yeah. And he makes money by basically doing a kind of like OnlyFans style video where he shoves things up his, uh, his anus. <laughs> oh, God. And he kind of realises later on halfway through the book that he's basically, his arsehole's getting really kind of like <laughs> worn out because he's an older man. And someone describes it as a, a, a leathery wizard sleeve oh. and it's just like fucking hell it's <laughs> it's just something Christ. else it really is something Jesus else Jesus Christ uh, and honestly I can only scratch the surface there of how <laughs> depraved it really does get and if that's your kind of bag you'll have a, there's times I burst out laughing at some of the lines yeah 
If there was ever a comic made for this show, it's, it's kind of this one, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it's uh, Simon Hanselman. What a creator! They're just uh, absolute beast. It's, we need to. We would. I'd love to get him on, man. Yeah, he's he's a fucking hand grenade, but I'd love to get him on. It's yeah. genuinely like that. I get shocked reading it, and that's very rare for me. Yeah, yeah. I come across panels or pages and I'm like fucking hell. <sighs> I think he's a bit like we do at Tribute. He's gone so extreme that people just don't have a go at him for it. You can't. What are you going to do against like that? We do, and I don't yeah. know what he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like you know, sort of like if you turn around, there's sort of a noise in the bus, and you turn around as an absolute mental person that holding a knife, looking out the window, rocking back and forward. You say, "Do you reckon you should say something to him about being quiet?" It's like, well, no, obviously not. No, <laughs> <laughs> you just leave him be. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! They take that. There's they take. Yeah. He takes the piss out of everything. everything. There's a great. There's a great um, antifa moment here that did make me chuckle. But yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, it's weird because they end up like getting in shootouts and kidnappings, people being beaten up. Uh, there's one scene where uh, Al, because he had a, a relationship with a slightly underage girl, like at the time she was like 16 or 17, he gets accused of being a paedophile. So Chris Hansen from Dateline NBC cheats trying to ca- catch him out as being a <laughs> paedophile. And then uh, he has like a bare chested fight with Werewolf Jones on the, the lawn where Werewolf Jones is saying, No, he's not a paedophile, he's fine. And it's just yeah. like, you just, <laughs> yeah, just can't believe I'm reading this. <laughs> so, yeah, crisis zone. <laughs> Don't get stuck at customs. Oh, Simon yeah. 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 Oh, wow. From, uh, from, from one twisted mind to another um which is which isn't a comedy book my one but it is a true crime graphic novel um and this is something we we spoke about recently like um, the interest in books like like this is sort of going up um this is from eric powell and harold schechner schechter i hope i got that wrong Right, right, wrong, whatever. Wrong. <laughs> I hope I got that wrong because I just absolutely murdered the name. Um, this is Did You Hear What Eddie Gein Done? Oh, um, fucking it came, hell. It came out last yeah, year. I've heard. Um, did, what you hear what, <laughs> did You Hear What Eddie Gein Done? is an in, in-depth exploration of the Gein family and what led to the creation of the necrophile who haunted the dreams of 1950s America and inspired such films as Psycho, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and The Science of the Lambs. Painstakingly researched and illustrated, this graphic novel takes the gain story out of the realms of exploitation and gives the reader a fact-based dramatisation of these tragic, psychotic and heartbreaking events because, in this case, the truth needs no embellishment to be horrifying. And that, I think, is a is a wonderful way to put it, and that was just a synopsis that I read, read from Amazon. Uh, this is a little hardcover book, 200-plus uh, pages, um, and... I know it was in a, a Tony. You told me it was in a lot of best of lists and stuff of last yeah. year, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and I was sort of fascinated. It's not. I think it was a year before, actually. Maybe. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's yeah. It's, yeah. It um, might be. It's not supremely readily available over here. Even when I was, uh, I just wanted to. I I got it via Amazon. The dreaded Amazon, right. but um, hardcover is only seventeen ninety nine at the moment. Um, but this is. An absolutely stunning book. Obviously, you can't. When you mention the name Ed Gein, and because of the way that um, society and pop culture and stuff, you think of like from, as you say, Psycho, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and the way that when it comes to this story, people always think of the the grossness, you know, the graphic and the horrible sort of nature of it, which you can't avoid because. You know that's part of it, but it's not. This is a, a proper look into it, and, and the research is there, and it's it's about um the the man himself and his family life and how it was it was horrific and tragic from page one. Do you know what I mean? Just just that, just that from his father and his mother and what his mother was like and how that affected him and. You know, obviously, there's a certain element of dramatization, but you can you can tell just from the the book cover itself, and that was one of the things that that drew me to it. I mean, Eric Powell's artwork is absolutely stunning. I mean, it always has been, and I I think in everything he's done, I know obviously the goon is obviously what he's mainly known for, but he's just an absolutely phenomenal artist. And the first page of this is like a a scene of, and it sort of it starts. It's almost like a sort of 
a documentary film the way it's almost displayed um because it starts with the the sort of premiere of psycho and it's just the first page is so stunning like it's the crowd outside psycho psycho and what then that alfred hitchcock talking about the psycho book and ed gein which is obviously he was inspired he was the inspiration for the book and then it tells it begins the story right at the very beginning of ed gein up until basically when when he dies um there is people it is those it's the classic tale of all you need to do is say what they found you don't need to show it you you, you know you, you, this isn't one of those yeah let's rev the chainsaws it's not it's not like that um there are some obviously have you got this on digital tony have you read this yet? i have yeah i've got to send a review copy for it yeah, yeah. have you read it yet Yes, I liked it. Um, yeah. So you'll know exactly what I'm talking about when I say there are pages that are pretty dark and and graphic in in its own way. But if you're if you want to you know if you're the sort of person's like oh I want to hear this is going to be like a Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Science of the Lambs type book. You know, there's going to be gore and stuff. No, there's there's four. No, his, his style doesn't lend itself to that yeah, anyway. Yeah. He's got this, that sort of mad magazine style, though, yeah, almost yeah. isn't he? And there, there is a couple of pages which are very taste. A couple of the shots are quite tastefully done. There are obviously a couple of grim pages, but out of a two hundred page story, it's probably five pages of what seems to be um, fact. It's almost like he's taken the reference from factual, like photographs that were taken at a scene, sort of thing. Because everything else is drenched in shadow. Um, there are there's a dream sequence. Which is a bit fucked. I mean, it does get into fucked up territory. Um, so there are. It's not for the faint of heart, but it is. A, it is fascinating. It is both. It, it's it's dark. It's it's tragic, but not not. It's it's because of what he did to other people. You know, to the other people. You know, the victims and stuff. But it also delves into when it all came out, how that happened, and how. Obviously, the media took over, and the policemen themselves, and that whole. And when Ed Gein was being questioned, that becomes a fascinating section of it. It's almost a story in in sort of definite chunks. It's almost like a a true crime series in some kind of ways because you have his family life, and then what what was happening when he was captured, and how the media took it, and then the final stages. So it's almost a book in four parts. Um, but it was fascinating. I couldn't read. It's not sit down and read in one sitting. I don't know about you, Tony. It's an easy read. No, it's a it's a long read actually. Yeah, yeah, it is. yeah. yeah. It's an easy read because they it's written very well. But it is, and I mean, I don't know if you picked up on this. As I was reading, I thought they've researched this. This is yeah, this yeah. is a research book, and mm. as well as it should. It was be. on the shelf briefly at Gosh, but I've not seen it recently. There. No. Yeah. yeah. Um. But yeah, and it just—I think it just came about in one of those. Oh, you should check this out. Probably some algorithm found like Kent State based on true, yeah, true events and that kind of thing. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is quite fascinating. Yeah, it's a worthy companion to Kent State, and well, more yeah. to Jeffrey Dahmer, isn't it? Yeah, more. Yeah, Dahmer's, yeah. yeah. Um, but like I say, it, this is from Albatross Books. Um, I think it's it was it was kind of surprising to me because it was Eric Powell as well. I thought, oh. It's quite interesting that he's moved in. Yeah, it surprised this me as well because it's a long book, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, that he's yeah. done. Yeah, and it's black and white. Um, and the, 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 just the way they break it into like different chapters, and each each chapter has its own sort of headline that is almost real macabre and sort of spine chilling in itself. Like whether one of them, one of the ones that stuck with me was archaeology in hell, which is the chapter when the police are basically talking about what when they were in his house when they finally went into his house what it was the stuff they were finding that's what they called it it was like being it was archaeology in hell um which must be a heavy metal al- album title of some kind <laughs> that's, yeah um very good um highly recommended not for the faint of heart um but it is genuinely it's not what i liked about it it's not exploitational i don't i'm not interested in that kind of stuff and like you see, they can. This sort of story can never be told on the screen, because it's just. I, I think this is a perfect example of why this medium can do what it can do, mm. um, because it it gets across. You you do learn more from this than you'll ever learn from any kind of adaption, or 
true crime documentary or things like that for me personally um, brilliant stuff did you hear what Eddie Gein done um, if you see it and uh, and you've been fascinated by it because I think with this character's name you hear Ed Gein and immediately people have an idea of what they think happened or no which has been blurred because they probably think he was like Leatherface um, and just I've read a couple of the books about him like genuinely he was quite a, a an amicable chap do you know what i mean he wasn't yeah. like yeah i think he just yeah he's look up up and down were completely reversed for him he did see no problem with yeah. what he was doing yeah and it, but this uh, yeah and this book obviously delves into the relationship he had with his mother hmm. um which was pretty fucked i mean it's all fucked pretty up. fucked up but yeah but the book is highly recommended so that's my one tony oh, interesting tony are you going to liven us up with something joyous well, yes yeah, so i uh, mine's um, Iron Head by oh, Stefano yeah, this, this Cardicelli. Fucking, yeah, published great. by Second Sight. Um, not a publisher I know much about, I'll be honest with you. Um, I bought this just totally off the cover, which is fucking brilliant. Really nice. Um, I don't even know how I would go to describe it. It's like a mashup of all your favourite, you know, it's like Jim Mar food, Mebius, Kirby, um, mixed with some slain 2000 AD work. You know, it's, it's, there's a real... Uh, uh, de- detailed but just fucking strong um, bombastic artwork um, The he's the last warrior so he's um, it covers it follows the, the character who's on the cover um, Duke Hagar he's a knight with a, he's kind of a punk version of a knight really this is kind of slain meets Dungeons and Dragons meets the Crusades you know meets punk and he's he's uh, he's he's been sent by King um, Argoroth the second, so it's got that whole sort of fantasy thing. Um, and there are two battle, two two battles going on. One, you know, two sides battling each other, and he is utterly unstoppable. And he's cutting sort of, sort of red swathes through the opposing army, relentlessly aggressive. And this war, this battle, has been going on for two years, and he is all that is left of one side, and he's just going at it with the other side. Everything that they put up against him, he just chops up. Um, there's a giant armoured pig with a sort of false metal eye, um, and he just chops him in half. And, and like nothing stands a chance. But as he's doing that sort of thing where warriors fight, and they also, you know, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to, you know, he's, he's he's very verbose in what he's saying. Um, like there's a wind, the, like the wind is full of arrows, and he just puts his shield up, and it, it's just beautifully done. And it ends up with him. He, he goes up against various things. But he, he ends up just doing that classic Conan slain thing where he's standing atop a hill of mounted bodies, you know, that sort of great image, as the vultures and crows circle around the top of him. Um, and he looks out around himself and on a mostly silent page as a sort of lo- a local hooded figure um, stares on, on at him, a kind of witch character. And he takes his helmet off at the end of the battle where he's defeated this army on it, pretty much on his own. And he says, my love, I've returned. And what he means there is he's done his duty and it's now his turn to return to his wife, to the woman he loves. So he begins his journey back. And as as has started, so continues in this book, it's just like mental battles. Um, he, he fights a, he goes into a sort of valley of madmen in a sort of, and a plague that they carry. And he fights his way through that. And he's carried across by this huge creek lizard bird thing. Uh, he fights his way all the way across, even even across the sea, where you know he he tries. The people try to capture him there. Um, so it's, it's. I mean, it's not a story we haven't seen before. To be fair, you know, we've always seen this sort of, you know, a knight battling. You know, it, it's not uh, unusual, but it's done so well. I mean, there's predictable tropes, and uh, and to be fair, a fairly predictable story almost. Um, but the art really lifts it and transforms it, and it is fucking absolutely rich on every single page. Um, there's, there's a real um, chaotic framing of stuff. You know, it goes from multiple panels to single page spreads, but like creatures bounce out of one panel into another and the blood splatters. It's, it reminds me of something, you know, Dan Charnley would like. It's that sort of thing, you know. Oh, wow. um, he's forever just chopping people's heads in halves and eyeballs are flying across the page and, you know, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stuff. I always had this couple of pages, which I found strange. There's, it, it goes like punk, 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 and then suddenly we're in, we're in the land of Xenoscope for two pages, and I didn't really know what was going on there. 
and um, one of the pages is sort of ill-sized. It's almost like he's drawn it for a different format um, with, with big white space at the top and the bottom. But I think maybe it's just the second site or a fairly new publisher or, you know. Um, but the rest of it is, is, is gorgeous and worthy. There's, the back of it has got a load of, um, I don't know what it is, maybe sort of preparation or warm-up or kind of gallery. And it's got a couple of the, it's got the, the cover, you know, it's a single image without the writing on it and stuff. And it's just brilliant. I went straight to his website to see if I could buy some of it. Um, but there wasn't any there. Um, refreshing, just absolutely refreshingly um, original and at the same time, very accomplished. Um, and he doesn't cut any corners on it. You know, there's, there's zero corners coming. I sent you guys some images of it. Tonight. Oh, yeah, yeah. When I was Great. reading it, I think you'd like it, V, because you like all yeah. that sort of fancy stuff. And I think you'd really dig this. It, it plays it plays about with the form as well. There's, you open it and you're presented with two white pages that just have blood splatter on them. You know, almost like they're pages that have been in the battle and they've just been splattered with blood. It's just nice. peculiar the way it's done. Very interesting. You can find him on Instagram, um, There's which is one you definitely have to follow. Go and have a look. He's done some work for Vertigo. I think I was chatting to Jordan Thomas. He says he did some some at least some covers for Hellblazer, I think, early on. He's done some stuff for Heavy Metal and he's done some stuff for 2000 AD. So, he's, you know, he's a fairly, fairly professional working artist. But you can find him at Steph, S-T-E-F, Steph, Cardo Selli, C A R D O S E W L I, Steph Cardo Selli on Instagram. So go, go and grab if you can find this. In, I found it, it was on the shelf. So I'm guessing it was in previews this, but brilliant stuff. Yeah, really good. Go and find it. I think it's just a, yeah, it's one shot, $4.99. So there you go. Yeah. Nice. Head. That's nice. Right. What a wide and wonderful group of comics for you to check out this week. As always. Um, and we hope you uh, go forth and pick some of them up and enjoy them and spread the word because that's why it's called a recommendation section. We just want other people to discover cool comics. And we hope you discovered some cool comics and also enjoyed this week's episode. Um, if there's anything you want us to talk about on upcoming episodes, please, please, please do let us know, whether it be events, um, charity fundraising, anything. Just let us know. You can get in touch with us, email awesomecomicspod at gmail.com follow us on twitter at the awesome pod that's probably gonna go quite lively with manga month which starts yeah. ne- which starts yeah. next week um so we will we'll be putting out that, some, we? we'll be um yep. putting out some uh questions some threads some you know some recommendations you got on the shonen jump app you be uh, i'm getting on that this week so nice work be yeah. nice um but we're going to start off with quite an intellectual bang hang on that sounds weird <laughs> mm. yeah yeah. Uh, um, Sorry, Helen. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, uh, Twitter. Well, if she's listening to this episode, she might, might not come on. Um, <laughs> at the Awesome Pod. Um, if you do the Book of Faces, go to facebook.com slash awesome comics podcast. Join the Facebook group, Awesome Comics Talk. There's a great community of people on there. Much like there's a great community of people on the Awesome Comics Podcast Slack channel. If you yes. want to uh, uh, join it, please let us know. And you can, it, it's just all comics, no faff, no, no, no hard selling. There's different channels for different things, you know. It's art, really good this week. Yeah, art, another great week. Art chat, uh, comics selling, etc. There's all kinds. And if you just want to talk about great stuff and about the show, then get on that. Thank you for listening to us, whether it was on the website, awesomecomics.podbean.com. If you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts, go on, subscribe. Say something nice about us in a review. We'd really appreciate it. We really would. Cause we haven't had one in a long time, have we? No, we've, no, we've got very fragile egos. So uh, uh. please fluff them with a, with a nice review. Um, but if you listen to us on any other network, well, I think wherever you listen to us, you should leave us a, a, a nice five-star review. <laughs> please. <laughs> Uh, we're desperate. No, 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 no. But if you listen to us on other networks like Spotify, Amazon, Stitcher, Podnose, Podknife, what are the networks we're on, Tony? We're on uh, Perry, the fraudulent time traveling squirrel network. <laughs> dear, dear God. Uh, well, can yes. I give a quick shout out? Because we forgot to this week. Our buddy Simon Robbins has a new book out, which he kindly sent us the um, the preview of um, called Slumber. Tells the oh, story of a nightmare, nightmare hunter. Yeah, mate, yeah. how good is that? Yeah, it's Fucking great. great, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I completely forgot to say it. Sorry, Simon. But yeah, we didn't forget about you, baby. Yeah, that's the, uh, yeah, it's, it's um, available in previews. Go and, go and pre-order that because I think it's going to be a big hit. Actually, I'm, I've got a feeling it's going to be a big thing. Uh, mm. uh, Image Comics, isn't it? Dan? Is that right? It is right. Yeah, Image Comics. Nice. Go check that one out. Good stuff. <laughs> nice. Didn't forget about you, baby. <laughs> oh, <my laughs> yeah, you like that. There's a t-shirt. 
Um, <laughs> and thank you for joining us this week, Steve. It's been an absolute pleasure, as always. You've been, been an absolute been legend. Blast, thank you. Um, yep. And uh, where can people find everyone online? I'll tell you what. Let's start with the guest. Steve, yeah, where, where, where can people find you and your comics? Um, timebombcomics.com is the website, but there's also an Instagram and there's Twitter. And I, I guess I'm quite easily found on uh, Facebook as well. So people are more than happy to, more than welcome to kind of hook up with me directly. Um, mm. Oh, uh, hook up, eh? Oh, 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 in a car park near Coventry. <laughs> I'll my headlights, Steve. You know what I mean. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, yeah, search us out and um, get in touch and check out what we do. Yeah, you really should because uh, Time Bomb does great stuff. And they've been doing it for 15 years now. I still can't believe that stuff. You're... What a pro. Um, <laughs> and uh, where can people find everyone else? Tony? Uh, patreon.com forward slash tribute press we've got a new story starting tomorrow watch out for that you had trouble saying dot com then didn't you yeah <laughs> thought I was gonna not notice it you surprised you? me I was drinking coffee and then I realised it's me again <laughs> <laughs> Dan what about you you can find me on twitter at vanguard comic and you can read vanguard at vanguard oh, like a steel fucking trap yeah. that man hey eh? that's He's... the old one that one but I thought you know bring it back yeah keep yeah. it real Keep it times. real. <laughs> and you can find me on social media at Jester Diablo. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. Um, wherever you are in the world, we hope you're doing okay, happy, healthy. And uh, yeah, we love you very much. Don't we, Dan? We hell, yeah, sure we do. <laughs> you're about to say, we hells, yeah, we do. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Tony. Don't it. Tony. What? T- what? Tell them you love them. No, I'm not telling that. Don't make me. Do it. <laughs> do it. Like you stop grooming me. What? <laughs> I'm like a chimp grooming him. Picking that Chimping. one. Chimping. We talked about that earlier. Yeah, yeah. Oh God, no. We're not getting into that again. Uh, um, but yes, have a great week, everyone. Read loads of comics. Make loads of comics. And uh, until we hear, we speak to you next. Have a brilliant week. And from Dan, Tony, Steve, and myself. What should they do, guys? Stay, Stay awesome. awesome. Beautiful. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye now. Dan, you're not saying bye. See ya. (laughs) (laughs) I wondered if you'd noticed that. Yeah. I'm not saying it. it. I'm not saying it. (laughs) See ya. See (laughs) ya.